to the How Could You Podcast. I'm Lauren Tossi. And I'm Ryan Tossi. Remember, my sentimental friends, that a heart is not judged by how much you love, but by how much you are loved by others. You know, going into this festive season, that feels like a really nice quote. I was thinking so. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you have never listened to our podcast before, we are two people who fell in love in a movie theater and never quite left. We started this podcast to film gaps in our film knowledge, but now it's just turned into movies that we really want to talk about. And we've been on a little hiatus, but we are coming back with a movie that... I mean, honestly, I don't even know how to talk about it because it's just so remarkable. It I've feels... never seen it before. Stop it, you. That's <laughs> such a lie. But you may have noticed from the title of this episode, we are not alone today, and we are so excited to welcome our good friend Anthony to the podcast. Anthony, can you introduce yourself to our audience and tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks, Hi. thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, my name is Anthony DeSanctis. Uh, I am the programming manager uh, at ArtsQuest. I'm the, the the lead programmer of the Frank Banco Alehouse Cinemas uh, and a huge movie uh, aficionado. I eat, breathe, sleep, poop, <laughs> fart movies. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, if you go in my letterbox, I look at it, I'm like, man, I need to get other things to do. So, yeah. This is exactly why we wanted you here. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say real quick, because I've listened to every episode that you have done, Um, and now that I have you here on this podcast, (laughs) guys, how could you not have seen The Goonies and Raiders of the Lost Rock? The Goonies and Raiders. And then I remember driving and just being like, what? How? It's just shame. Just shame. Yeah, we just, yeah, I mean, no one feels, I mean, here's the thing, in some ways, I mean, it's why we started a podcast, but at the same time, I can't help but feel still a little embarrassed by those omissions. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of wish you had just asked that question and then just left. Right? <laughs> just sort of like, this thing's done. This yeah. is why I agreed to be yeah. on and now I'm done. <laughs> but like, no, because I remember just listening to uh, the episode when you watch Raiders and you say right as the movie starts, like right as you're about to watch it, yeah. you say, oh, I've never seen this one. And you were just like, well, I feel like I would just death stare you <laughs> the entire movie. You'd watch Raiders and I'd just be there like... There was a lot of shock. I'm, the, yeah. the good thing was we were at the drive-in, so yeah. she couldn't pause the movie. I think that might have saved me. <laughs> it really did, because honestly, I remember like just looking at him the rest of the time going, why? How? I couldn't even enjoy the movie because I was just so confounded. And the thing was, is like, in so many ways, like, first off, like the fact that you had seen Crystal Skull before he ever saw Raiders <laughs> uh-huh. is still, like, it's troubling, actually. And then, like, I had, I, in my defense, I had seen Last Crusade before I saw Crystal Skull. That's not a defense. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely not a defense. But it's, like, weird because I think about, like, so we are big Disney people. We go to Disney all the time. They have that big stunt show spectacular. And I'm like, so that is your first experience of Raiders was the stunt show spectacular at Disney's MGM Studios and not the actual film. It's, no, it was actually the great movie ride. Uh, there is that that segment of... <laughs> but is that supposed to be more like Temple of Doom? Oh, yeah, you're probably right. Ha! Technically, that's the first one. So. Wow, well, this is true. In this a way. I, I, when I had emailed you about coming on this show and I, I gave you a list of possibilities of films we were discuss- discussing, I remember you asking, I just want to make sure, did neither of you, or had I, either of you had ever seen Wizard of Like, had, yeah. was this a how could you for either of you? And I was just like, quickly, as quickly as I could write back and be like, no, 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 we've seen that. This is a whole different thing. <laughs> Well, honestly, because, I mean, if we hadn't seen Wizard of Oz, we shouldn't have a film podcast. You should kick me off of cinema (laughs) committee and and delete our contacts from your phone. Your words, not mine, but, yeah. I appreciate you not kicking Lauren out of, you know, her her, her, horror series or cinema committee members. It'd be great if on the front of, like, the cinema there was just, like, a a no Lauren's allowed sign, like, if this had actually been the reality. But, so we have comfortably seen Wizard of Oz. We appreciate that you're Mm -hmm. a longtime listener, first-time participator. (laughs) Um, But we do want to know, like, so you run an amazing movie theater you are an incredible programmer you you. offer like so much the lehigh valley so i have to ask like what is your favorite part of running a movie theater my favorite part honestly uh i i mean i'm someone who always i am that person who i like streaming but i believe there's nothing better than physical you know actually seeing a movie in a movie theater the movie going experience to me is the best part. Just having that shared experience with people for two hours, you know what I mean? And, like, I actually like the programming end of it because it's nice to program certain titles and you just see people all excited to watch it. Even, honestly, there have been times I'll program, like, a deep cut or, like, a major cult title. Maybe eight or nine people show up, but they are so enthused and excited and, you know. But, honestly, I am jealous of the people the most that, like, 
th- this could be a whole how could you thing with random <laughs> guests. But like every now and then when it's a major release, I always ask before the like during the introduction, has anybody here never seen this movie before? You know what I mean? And we get people like at Jaws. There's always yeah. like four or five people that raise their hand, and I'm like. One, how could you? But, <laughs> but, but two, like, I'm jealous that your first time seeing this movie is on the big screen. Like, I will never get a first experience watching a film again, you know what I mean? Yeah. And to say that I can get that on the big screen, like, I'm, I'm so jealous, you know? So, right. so but that's it. I, I like providing opportunities uh, for people to see whether or not it's classic films or things you would never normally see around here uh, and the experience of that. I, I like the event stuff we do. Even the Christmas vacation, you know, where everybody dresses up and we do the quote off like contest. <laughs> like I love all that stuff. It's fun. So yeah. yeah. It's honestly and that the Christmas vacation at Frank Bank Oil House Cinema, that night is an experience within itself. If you're a devoted fan, that quote along yeah. is an incredible experience. Do you have Oh gosh, this is probably going to be a really tough question for you because you've programmed so much. Do you have like a like a favorite movie that you've gotten to show in the cinema that you got to program it and you're like that one? I'm so stoked that I got to put in there. I do, and it's <laughs> this. You're going to be like, really? That's your answer. Um, so we've in the in the past being able to program certain like Disney titles has been tough, like animated mm-hmm. films. But some of their like '80s and '90s more cult catalog they have been mm-hmm. flexible with uh so i think this was 2018 maybe 2019 i got to play heavyweights <laughs> yes. oh, and yes. heavyweights is one of my top 10 favorite movies of all time <laughs> if i were to actually show you my list there's going to be one outlier that, like, <laughs> it's like nine really prestigious films in my opinion and heavyweights um but yeah and look we had 12 people there i made them do uh a tony perkis like impression competition <laughs> uh and i consider that one of the greatest moments of my life so uh, that, that's amazing <laughs> such a solid answer yeah. i mean that's the beauty of what you do is that you are able to you know you were talking about and speaking so beautifully about the fact of bringing kind of this movie magic to people like i think that's really awesome and and one thing that i think the three of us totally agree on which is just the theater experience is just its own thing but i just love the fact that you're also able to bring in this kind of uh when you can personal touch to it and that's that's just awesome you know i love i think the the best film whatever we want to call them you know, nerds, passion on it, you know, cinephiles are the ones that have, you know, the classics and the cult classics mm, in yeah. there. So your top ten, I would love to hear one day. Because yeah. I just want to see that that random heavyweights in there. <laughs> my top, I mean, my top ten is tough because there's always like one or two that change. Oh, all, yeah. On my letterbox, I have like my 100 favorite that are like listed chronologically. I could probably give you like five and then it's like, yeah, but yeah, so... Do it. We want the five. Do it. All yes. right. So uh, now I'm going to go five through one. Okay. okay. All right. I like that because uh, there, there's the anticipation of the draw. Right. Yeah. It gives our audience yeah. a, a knowledge of, yeah. you know, where they're going with this. All right. So some honorable mentions, I yeah. will say. Um, just real quick. I love on, an honorable mention. Honorable mentions. <laughs> uh, heavyweights. Um, <laughs> I love Carrie. Um, oh, wow. What else? Uh, Another Round is probably my favorite movie of the last couple of years of this decade. Your passion for that film. I was like, I had said to him, I was like, we have to watch this because how Anthony talks about this movie is like a whole different level. And it did not disappoint. (laughs) I'm so glad you were like really pushing people to watch that film. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Someone said uh, during the Oscars 2020, um, when they had the nominations during Surprises, that someone was surprised to find Thomas Vinterberg was nominated for Best Director during <laughs> the show. I'm not. I don't forget things like that. Anthony brought receipts <laughs> today. I'm so did. stoked. Rewind the tape, please. I just spilled my water in shock. And then this is the part where you guys will insert that clip. Of, I can't believe Thomas Vinterberg was nominated. He did say that. But um, I was Sorry. Anyway, trying to go with my I knowledge. What have I uh, said in the past? <laughs> I also really love uh, a single man with uh, Colin Firth, uh, oh, the yeah. Tom Ford film. But my okay, five through one. Um, number five uh, is I am a man who is thirty-two. This might be the most basic <laughs> answer. Uh, the Dark Knight is oh, oh, one that's of my. Oh yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, Three times in the first 48 hours it came out. Wow. Because um, I used to work at Regal Cinemas like when I was in high school then through college seasonally. Um, so The Dark Knight. Uh, and I think the reason I love it is just honestly because 
in many ways, like, yes, it's a Batman movie, but it doesn't need to be about Batman. You could just right. put any two characters into that movie other than Batman and the Joker, yeah. and I think it's the same movie. Yeah, true. Um, so that, Rebel Without a Cause, the first true teen angst film, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, I've just always felt a deep connection to that. Uh, number three is Whiplash, which is my oh, favorite movie uh, of uh, yeah, excellent. the last decade. Um, I've actually, I'll get to my number one, and, and I want to say, prefacing this, that... Um, my number one usually is a movie that if I'm dating someone and I'm getting serious, I show them that movie to see how they like it. <laughs> but lately I've been actually thinking, I think Whiplash is the better approach to that. Just to, you know, because I think my favorite movie, which I'll say, uh, you know, is my sense of humor, I think, in a lot of ways. But um, I think Whiplash is a good way for me to figure out just where people's taste level is at. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, no, I get that. So. And also then it's not the... Hey, this seems like it's going well, and then they hate my number one movie, and then what do you do with yeah, that? Right? You know? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So I, I use Whiplash as, a, and the film is subjective. We all have our own opinions, but mm-hmm. I think if someone likes Whiplash even remotely as much as I do, okay, I think this yeah, is a yeah. person I can show you know <laughs> yes. anything to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so number two is the film we're about to talk about, yes! The Wizard of Oz. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I love The Wizard of Oz with a passion, which. I won't go into more because we're going to be getting to that. But my favorite movie uh, is from 1959. Billy Wilder directed Some Like It Hot. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Every line is a pun or a euphemism. The movie's ahead of its <laughs> yes. time. In many yes. ways, it's the hangover of its time, you know? Okay. But I think it's brilliant. Uh, all the performances. Jack Lemmon became my favorite actor because of that movie. So, yeah. So I would show a lot of people that movie. Uh no, let me rephrase I would show people who I was interested in dating that movie. Saying a lot of people makes it sound like I have a very active dating life. <laughs> it's very sad. Uh, I have a girlfriend now. It's good. She saw the movie before I met her. Oh, so Perfect. Oh, good. good. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. So that must have been like, yeah. oh, okay, so you you have some taste. You have some interest. Because yeah. Some Like It Hot is one mm-hmm. of those movies that, like, I, you know, when you talk about, like, classic Hollywood mm-hmm. cinema, and there are so many titles that come up, but I'm like, I feel like with that one, it kind of is mapping, like, this, like the landscape of American comedy, but in a way in which I don't think it often gets the credit for it, because mm-hmm. I think it gets so, like, pigeonholed. So you saying it's, like, the hangover of its time, I think, is really important, because it's, like, it's so much about, I think everyone was trying to get to that level of esteem of, like, how do we make it that quick, that pithy, mm-hmm. that, like... Kind of loaded, I agree with you, some kind of like some progressive sexual politics that I do not think were present in other comedies of its time. Such a good pick. I knew that was your favorite movie, but I also wanted to hear you talk about it yeah, too. No, yeah, Sound, yeah, yeah. Sounds like a great movie, guys. I hate you so much. You've never seen that movie. <laughs> Can I come back and be like, dude, what the heck? And then we just do this. <laughs> so legitimately, you said some like it hot and I saw something in his eyes like twitch and I went, oh no. I have two that I have to say I'm on your list that I'm ashamed to I think I know the say, other one. Or how could you for me? The rebel about a cause? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. No, it's not fair. I should. It's terrible. And I actually. will say this. I, it's one of those movies that now, because we, it has been on our short list for me for you know going forward to do on this show because it's one I know I have to see. Um, but I, I, you've always talked about. I don't know how yeah. we've never. It can, so. I, you know what? Honestly, because like, so this is like the benefit, and I don't know if you had a similar childhood experience, but like, I watched Turner Classic movies like it was my job in life. Like, mm-hmm. I would come home from school, and I'm like, I could do homework, or see what's on TCM, and like, and that was such a gift to grow up in a time not only when cable TV was still like our main form of getting media at home, but also because someone was curating it you mm-hmm. know there was a person that came out and like talked about the film and I think in that way it I had such an obsession with it because of that but you and I have talked a lot about that if you didn't have that like then who's exposing you to those classic films and I think you came to an appreciation of things like that maybe a little bit later in your film yeah development. very much so yeah I just I for whatever reason the I don't we've been talking about this term classics a while a lot lately and what's deemed as a classic and you know what age does a film have to be to be classic um so I want to use that loosely when I say it, but some of the classics I did I just missed like my family was great and given me from an early age a plethora of wide range of films um you know of of any type but it was just like there seemed to be a cutoff for whatever reason yeah 
It's okay. This is a safe space. I know on the podcast I just said I hate you. I don't hate you. But also, I <laughs> want you good. to see some like it's hot. hot. <laughs> I don't know what rage feels like, but this is probably it. No, I'm just kidding. You're, you're fine. You're great. Hey. And by the way, uh, The Dark Knight to me, I, I have to say, honestly, I, I that film to me, I always associate with you now. Really? Uh, because I knew you, I know your passion for it and, and how much you love it. And for us, we it was the first theater we saw, or the first film we saw back in the theater after... Um, the start of the, the pandemic. Lockdown, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and I had such a... I always loved the movie. I mean, to me, Heath Ledger's performance in that is probably one of the top five greatest performances of all time. Um, but I never had... I didn't have quite the same appreciation that I thought I should. But I always knew that you... Because you talked so highly of it, and I know she... Had, and so when we saw it, I got to watch it with a different lens. Plus, just being back in the theater. So now I always have this, such a... That film, I have such a even... I feel weird because it's probably one of the best you know, superhero films ever made, but... Um, and probably one of the best films ever made. I mean, like, yeah. there's so much craft in that, yeah. and, like, and I think, you know, it's one of those movies that I realize that, like, so many people come to, like, even if they have no interest in superhero films, even if they're not a big Nolan person, mm-hmm. like, even if Nolan's, like, not their guy, there's something about that film that really, really brings people, like, around the campfire. It's a crime epic. Like, that's yeah. what yeah. it is, yeah. so... But, hey, if you guys ever want to watch Rebel Out of Cause or Something Like It Hot in the theater... You're welcome to. Yes, so we'll definitely take. I you might on be money. there in the back, also watching, <laughs> <laughs> judging. I, you yeah. you helped us out with Goodfellas for that, yeah, which yeah. again, thank you for Such that very experience. much. Um, so yeah, we you know this might be this nice you know. Yeah. <laughs> but you know we are here. Well, we one one more point of order, and then we have to talk about this like absolutely spectacular film, which is your number two, and which is I think it's funny when you said that. I'm like I think I often neglect. Also, I'm terrible at making like I, I won't define a favorite movie. I'm like awful. I refuse to pick. Mm-hmm. But often when I'm making lists, I think I forget to put Wizard of Oz in it because I just think of it as the automatic of like, well, yeah, it's like the best movie ever made. Like, so obviously it should just be in the list. But I will, we always do a Tossie's Takes, like something you want to like recommend to the audience, something that you've watched recently or experienced recently that you want to offer. So I'll ask you, Anthony, do you have a Tossie's Take or DeSantis Take this week? Yeah, well, so I... This is a bad movie. Okay. <laughs> Great, <laughs> even it. better. It will probably make my worst films of the the year list at the end, but I also loved it. Um, I just watched that Netflix Lindsay Lohan movie, Falling for Christmas. <laughs> It's so bad, but I would recommend it to anyone. I had so much fun watching this god awful. Okay, honestly, it's a Netflix movie, and Netflix is trying to get into like the Christmas Hallmark yes. thing. But this is literally like ho- every Hallmark cliche you could like. How much Hallmark of a Hallmark, Hallmark of a Hallmark of a Hallmark of a Hallmark? You know what I mean? Like. Literally, I always say that, like, the trope in every Hallmark movie is, like, oh, no, they have to save an inn. They save an inn in this movie. <laughs> like, that's it. It's it's not good. Everyone's bad. Um, yeah. But watch it. But it's comforting? It, it's, I, does it I, have some comfort? Does it feel like it should be a parody? Yeah, in a way. But if it's playing straight, <laughs> I'm almost like, is this supposed to be satire? Like, I don't know. But, but I, I had a smile on my face the whole time. <laughs> you know, I... Recommend it for everyone. It can bring people together. It can break them up. I don't know. I just really... <laughs> You're just here promoting the Lohanna songs. You're like, come yeah. on, guys. Let her have this. People should use it to judge, you know, who they're dating. <laughs> <laughs> it's not... <laughs> yeah. I, 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 have three, I, I, I gotta be honest with you. You had said to us before we started here that you had a movie, but it was bad. You definitely still shocked me. Yeah. <laughs> You're Not welcome. in a bad way. <laughs> oh my god, Lauren, do you have one? You find so different than that. Um, Probably a good movie. Yeah, it is a good movie. It's a great movie. Um, although, although you know, my lovely co-host in this said like it would be kind of a basic response. Like I have to, I have to trumpet like go see Wakanda Forever. Um, oh and, yeah, yeah. And like absolutely damn you if you don't. Um, Oh, no. I mean, like, you can be busy this time of year. That's totally fine. Um, let me not be judgmental. I just, I loved it. Like, I I, I was so excited to see this. Uh, Black Panther, you know, has been my favorite Marvel film for a very long time. I mean, you know, since it came out. Like, I was like, okay, this is it. Like, this is the Apex Mountain for me in Marvel films. Um, you know, like everyone was, you know... Th- felt like that incredible loss of this like you know visionary actor and an incredible presence like in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and I was excited to see what they did with it but cautious because like you know when you have something that you feel is like the most perfect Marvel movie like well what do you do with the sequel um 
but I thought they nailed it. And I was really excited about it. I felt like it balanced a lot of things. It had to balance a lot because the problem is it's not that you just killed a character off. The person died. So what mm-hmm. do you do with that? And it's a young person that died. So um, I loved it. I, I, you know, if you're going in cautiously because you don't know what they're going to do with it, or if you're feeling beleaguered by Marvel films, I hope this like, you know, enlivens your spirits. I loved it. Anthony, did you like Mar- Wakanda Forever? I really loved it a lot. Yay. Yeah, it was very <laughs> emotional. And I think I also respect, I mean, <clears throat> Ryan Coogler is, uh, uh, I think, one of the best directors working today. Absolutely. But, True. like, the fact that, and I read this interview with where he said that he had talked to Chadwick even, like, weeks before he passed, talking about Black Panther, to, like, he had a script written and basically had to chuck it and start all over again. And, like, that was two years ago. So this <laughs> movie was written from scratch, and, you know, I'm sure there were probably some elements. I imagine Namor was probably in there anyway, yeah, yeah. you know. But, like, I'm just impressed by the quality of the product they put out, knowing they had to start over two years ago, and the respect given to Chadwick Boseman, like, yeah, I... Yeah, and mm. not even just two years. I mean, that's two years of the emotional weight yeah. that you had on you to, mm-hmm. to try to find this balance of, you know, honoring your friend and honoring the audience. Like, yeah. it was that's a tough... <laughs> tough to pull off, but I agree with you. Coogler is so... And that's what makes, I think, Wakanda Forever so special is the emotional center of that movie completely. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. So we've got Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> we've got Wakanda Forever. Ryan, what take do you have this I, week? I do have one quick one. We won't have to. We won't linger on it because you won't let me because of the time of the year it is. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you didn't even get to watch it with me, so it, it's a one that I, I watched with by myself. Yeah. But it's Barbarian. Oh, uh, I love that. That was yeah. actually going to be my second choice. Oh, good movie. Yeah, 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 she yeah. hasn't seen it. <laughs> yeah. And. Because I'm sure you can, you know, agree, it's not a movie you should know anything about before no. you go into yeah. it. Yeah, like, so, <laughs> the trailers tell you nothing. Yeah. They, you think yeah. you're getting one movie until you're not. Yeah. So, so to our audience, <laughs> I, this is what I will say. Barbarian, if you like horror movies and R-rated horror movies, check it out. Absolutely check it out. It is really, really cool, well done film, and that's all we can really say about it. I promise you, before The Great Turkey arrives, I will watch Barbarian. Please do. Like, I have like a shut-off valve at this time of year where I'm like nothing spooky, nothing weird, it's holiday centric, it's terrible, and I'm kind of, I'm gonna be honest, like I'm a, like a like a TV terrorist like when it comes to our picks, he'll be like, let's put this on, I'm like, it's not holiday, stop it. Like, I will watch Barbarian. Because right. your reaction and your reaction to it... <laughs> I feel like I'm missing out on something. I mean, if not, there's always Falling for Christmas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to watch them back to back. That's the double feature yeah. tonight. I'm going to Barbarian and then Falling for Christmas. So you like only watching holiday movies Just this time the of truth. year, right? This is the truth. Like, so we are in the uh, Thanksgiving season. Yes. So If you so celebrate. Yeah. yeah. So this is a good time to pivot, I would say, if you will. Um, I just have a question for you. Yes, Ryan Tossi. You could have picked, you know, for our Thanksgiving episode, you know, we, we've done planes, trains, and automobiles. You could have done Home for the Holidays. You chose Wizard of Oz. So my question, genuinely, is for actually both of you, but we'll see where you fall on this, Anthony. But but to Lauren, how could you call the Wizard of Oz a Thanksgiving movie? Because it is. <laughs> End of discussion. All right. Anthony, it's been great to have you here. Um, no, <laughs> We are about an hour into the podcast, so that works. So, well, I, before, oh, I, uh, <laughs> before I offer, Anthony, do you consider this a Thanksgiving movie, or are you on Ryan's side? And it's completely fine if you're on Ryan's side with this. I feel like I'm testifying. <laughs> <laughs> Choose. I don't. Oh, no! Okay, so that's actually how I kind of remembered this. So here is my pitch why. So Please do. My, so obviously my family, and I think very similarly with your family experiences, you know, we gathered a lot around film. And there were certain movies that at certain times of the year you just kind of watched together. And there were certain movies that, like, I very much associate as, like, everyone kind of came together to watch that. Like, one of those is The Shining. Like, that's a family movie to me. Which is... <laughs> It, it says I mean, probably it a lot. It says a lot about my family that it's a family movie. Where are you but, from originally? Uh, a little bit of ever so Jersey via Texas to here. That checks out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so no matter. My parents are from the Bronx, like so. It's a little bit all over the place. So 
we used to watch, like, I have the most distinct memories of watching Wizard of Oz the week of Thanksgiving. And I was trying to figure out why this is. And I've talked to a few other people. Um, you know, one is Ryan Hill. We've talked about this. We associate it with being like a Thanksgiving movie. And I was trying to remember why. And then so I had to do a little digging and research because I wanted to fact check myself that this is not some like imagined thing. Oh, you're coming with receipts now, aren't you? I am. <laughs> so so the Turner Company had acquired the rights to Wizard of Oz, and every single year they would play it on the week of Thanksgiving, and they would play it on the week of Easter. I don't, I don't know why, and I have no association with this with Easter, but I do have very strong associations of it would be on TV, and this comes back to what we were talking about earlier, of this idea of like, well, when things were only on once a year... And the only way you watched it was, like, as a family, like, you know, when it was on TV, that, like, kind of event television idea, we always watched Wizard of Oz that way. Now, we had, I mean, I don't think we had Laserdisc. We had a friend who had a Laserdisc, but we had VHS, we had DVD. Like, it's not like we didn't have those forms of media, but Wizard of Oz, I have the most distinct memories of, it would always be on, like the Tuesday or Wednesday of the Thanksgiving week. And I actually was able to fact check this because that's when, so the Turner Co- Media Company would play it. I think on either, whichever one they own. Is it TBS or TNT? I can never remember. Uh, TNT? Is it TNT? So they play it on TNT the week of Thanksgiving every single year. So that's why I think it's a Thanksgiving movie, because it would always come on at this time of year. It's fair. Actually, I can't, I mean, you've come back with the, uh, a very specific reason. <laughs> and also, no, I have nothing from the film that actually backs this, other than it just used to come on at this time of What's year. It? No, go on, no, 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 I, no, you please. All right, okay. <laughs> I, I will say, I actually, in thinking about this, um, I associate this movie not with Thanksgiving, but with the fall. So, oh, like, okay. Um, I went and saw the movie. Uh, <clears throat> there was a Fathom event in 2009 for the 70th anniversary uh, at the AMC Rockaway in Rockland, New Jersey. <laughs> Shout out to actually my favorite multiplex. Yeah, Sometimes I'll drive like an hour to go watch like three movies in that beautiful theater. They also have a very sexy Target nearby. Walk inside, <laughs> yep. you'll get it. I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, so I drove there to see that, and that was in September. And then I always felt that like as the years go on, anytime there was like a reissue of the film or like a DVD or Blu-ray release, it was always in like September, October, November. So like, and then I think about when I'm a kid, I go to Country Junction, you know that place? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're up right by Country Junction. Yeah. 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 And there's, you know, uh, there's like a a pumpkin patch and stuff. But anytime you'd walk in there, there would always be Wizard of Oz on in the background, at least the one I went to. So I associate it with the fall. So... But I don't want to place it in October because it doesn't feel like a Halloween movie. Um, so I think a few haunted houses over the year do try to force yeah. it into the into a, <laughs> yeah. a being a Halloween. I would say it's a September or a November movie, whatever that means. But not a one day Thanksgiving movie <laughs> or the week of. I know. I know. We'll do our little discussion here about um, like when we first saw this yeah. and stuff like this. But sure, sure. I have to actually say something in your defense because we've talked a lot about this with um, siblings and our siblings will fact check us a lot when we say stuff on this and we'll come back. I fully expect Dan to text me. That's my brother. Uh, after this movie, we never watched And I'm curious <laughs> on, 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 especially my sisters, whether they will reach out because as you're talking about that, that's how I remember growing up with the movie, too. Like, that it was event television. Like, you know, the whole family. Like, I remember being in my parents' room and sitting with my, my siblings and watching this. And um, and every year. And I think even not... To, I think Full House even did a whole bit about that on one of their episodes. Oh, like for one real? Time. Yeah, where the whole family was... Sitting. So I remember that. The curiosity that I have is I'm wondering if it was around Thanksgiving and it just wasn't one of those things that ever you know, sunk to me, or maybe, see, I would have thought it was the springtime, so I'm curious if we always watched it then. Which, honestly, I could see people associating yeah. with the springtime because of the imagery in the film. That would actually make a lot of sense to me. And I think it's probably because, if you think about it, although, like, certainly, like, planes, trains, and automobiles, and home for the holidays, but there's not, like, a lot of Thanksgiving-themed movies. A very Thanksgiving Charlie Brown? Was that one called? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. There's, like, maybe it's because there's not a lot of per- so they went, like, people are looking to sit down for a movie, so this might be a way of doing that. Well, we talk about March of the Wooden Soldiers with Laurel and Hardy. Yeah. In our household, it's considered a, a Thanksgiving movie. There's not one aspect of that as Thanksgiving. But really? We watch it every Thanksgiving morning. Because, weirdly... Yeah. Both of our families always watched it on Thanksgiving yeah. morning, and I don't know why. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a reason behind this, but I don't know actually what the reason is. So, uh, so 
debate's still up in the air if this is actually a Thanksgiving movie, and it probably actually isn't. It's just you know how I associate it. It's a Thanksgiving film in your heart. <laughs> it is, yes. You know, you know, if their film is in your heart that way, like, you know, a Christmas movie that's oh, Nightmare it. Before Christmas is a Christmas movie to you. Actually, quick, quick, quick question for you, Anthony. Nightmare Before Christmas, Christmas movie or Halloween movie? What's that? I left my oven on. Excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> but no, I, it, no, but I think that's, yeah. isn't that what holiday films especially are about? It's about these memories and nostalgia. Yeah. Um, and it's nostalgia for you. So I'm totally down for this now being a considered a Thanksgiving movie. Although I will have to say the event television aspect of it, I don't know if ne- the generations growing up now would have the same way of I'm trying to decide it. if I'm sad for them that they don't. Because there was something about that of like, okay, well, Rudolph's on on Friday night at this time. So this is when we're watching it. I don't know. That feels old lady crotchety of me. <laughs> so Anthony, I'll ask you. This is your number two uh, all time fa- of in your all time favorite movies list. When did you do you remember when you first saw Wizard of Oz? My mother says this is the first movie I ever saw. <gasps> oh, um, yeah, that's so magical. Mm-hmm. So uh, and I would. She says that I used to dance on the kitchen table to If I Only Had a Brain as a little kid. <laughs> I would cry every time the movie ended. Uh, 32 years later, nothing has changed. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I, I will say, like... <clears throat> so stay tuned, everybody. We're yeah. going to have him singing. <laughs> there are a few movies... I just want to say, I don't cry a lot during films. I don't. Um, I'm not made of stone. I feel things. I get moved emotionally. Maybe, like, a single tear will fall. Like, at the end of Shang-Chi... I'm watching my brother he looks at me and goes, are you crying? I'm like, this movie is so good. I yeah. love it. But anyway. Truth. Yeah. But so there are certain movies, though, from my childhood that, like, I do, tra- I just want to say, I should preface, if, a, if, unfortunately, like, if an animal passes in a movie or something, I will be in an uncontrollable mess. But certain movies from my childhood, though, I think hit me harder now than when I was younger. Uh, and there's a line at the end of The Wizard of Oz when uh, they're all saying goodbye to Dorothy and the Tin Man goes... Now I know I have a heart because it's breaking. <laughs> Literally, I was sad as a kid. It's sadder now. Like that and the end of ET, I think, still make me oh. an uncontrollable mess, like to this day. So, and Toy Story 3, but uh, that's a story for another day. So, well, Toy Story 3, I mean, like, if you got through that ending without cry, like, I just remember the entire theater. I'm like, there's like a river of tears in this theater the first time we saw it. Like, who's not, like, as they're going towards, like, I no. just got kicked out of that theater. So did I, did I, ever, did I ever tell you my Toy Story 3 story? Some, I have to know. I, I, I think I remember, actually, I <laughs> would love to hear it again because we when we did, we got to do one of those virtual uh, programs with you during oh, yeah. the pandemic. The audience has to know, Anthony. Yeah. Why yeah, did you get right. kicked out of the theater? So, wait, you got kicked out of the theater? <laughs> almost, 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 almost. So my brother and I, Toy Story 3 comes out. Like, we are around the age of Andy. Like, yeah. We're 18 and 20 when the movie comes out, and we're in this theater full of little kids. And I'm like, I hate that these kids are here for this kids' movie. This movie's for me. <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> the end of the movie, when you think the toys are going to get incinerated, and they all hold each other's hands, my brother and I are there, like, real intense, like, I grab his hand, and I go, <laughs> and I yell in this theater, this is how Toy Story F and ends. <laughs> yeah. Only, only I didn't say F. Uh, you know. So, a mother looks... But turns around, she goes, excuse me. I was like, this movie's for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, so then, um, basically, you know, uh, the toys survive. Uh, my brother and I let go of our hands. Uh, the mother gives me a death stare in front of me. And then the movie ends, and, you know, Andy plays with the toys for the last time with little Bonnie. And I'm crying. And I look at my brother, he's like, oh. <laughs> and we're the only people crying in this theater of little kids. <laughs> and that's why Toy Story 3 is not for children. It's for me. <laughs> anyway. Okay, I'm sorry. Can I, can, you know, you told that story, but there were things you left out the time I heard that story. I had an audience. I mean, I have an audience yes, now. No, no, no. It's in that audience. I didn't want to say F, you know, so. Very fair. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sidetracking. That is an amazing story. Listen, anybody that listens to this show know there's a lot of sidetracks. Okay, all right. Cool. I feel better. (laughs) We had one time there was something that was written about our our show, and it was like, it's really good, but they they don't talk about the actual subject very often. Oh. (laughs) And I was like, accurate. Yeah. (laughs) But this is our podcast, and you listen to every episode. So you said you did have seen this in the theater before. Yeah, I saw it... uh, 2009 when they restored it and remastered it. 
And that was before I was really into, like, uh, most of my exposure to movie theaters was multiplexes. Yeah. So, like, yeah. they didn't do a lot of throwback titles, you right. know? And I was like, oh, I've always wanted to see this in a theater, you know? Yeah. So I went. It was great. Loved it. Um, and then I've seen it during reissues and re-releases, and we play it every year at Arts Quest, so I typically watch it once a year. I also just watch it for myself a lot. So I would say I probably watch this movie three times a year. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So around Thanksgiving, around Easter. Easter. (laughs) (laughs) Around when Arts Quest plays it, yeah. I watch it when I feel like it. (laughs) And one should always feel like watching Wizard of Oz, because it's just... (laughs) It, it's pure happiness. We, you know, it, we, when we sat down to watch it in, like, preparation for this, like, I, after, you know, the the opening section in Kansas and she's singing somewhere, I'm like, why do we not watch this, like, once a week? Just to be like, mm-hmm. I need to feel better about life. And Wizard of Oz just has that, like, immense power. Um, so talking about this film, because it's incredible, we all love... Oh, actually, I'm sorry, Ryan. When did you first see Wizard of Oz? My apologies. Oh, I actually don't remember. Um, Nor do I. Yeah, so great. I just... <laughs> Anthony, I'm glad you had an answer for this, because I realized I did not... No, and, I, remember, and... I remember seeing it as a kid, but I don't have a specific time. I remember seeing the first time in the theater was with you. Uh, we were in there. We were in, like, the first row watching it. No uh, uh, seats. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I remember our niece came in with her friend and was sitting in the back, um, you know, so th- which we weren't playing planning on that so just happened that you know way, yeah. it was just kind of like you talked about i remember very much talking to her and going it's wizard of oz in the theater like we have to go mm-hmm. see this so yeah so i remember that i remember mohan valley drive-in seeing it for the first time at the drive-in um i would love to do that yeah that yeah. would be cool yeah i love that they do that at the beginning of the season every oh, year they do they do yeah. they start their season every year with a double feature of that and willy wonka what yeah <laughs> I gotta go to this place more. I went twice in the last year, saw Big Lebowski, and then I did a, a double Devin Sawa double feature. Oh, yes. And yeah. they were both amazing. By the way, I was listening to your interview with Virgil as I'm driving to Mahoney. I was like, oh, what are the odds? Uh, but, okay, well, that's kind of incredible. That's yeah. like the exact way we wanted people to experience yeah. that interview, too. Yeah, yeah I'm ready to retire now. That yeah, was, that's that it. Kind of hit Done. Me. Yeah. But that's a delightful double feature. I'm doing yeah. it. So. No, it's amazing. Please do. We go up, we try and go up every year to it. Last year. Actual 35 millimeter prints. Yeah, yeah, it's actual 35 millimeter prints, so it shows agent that's like beautiful we did it one year where we did the pink floyd thing we had a like a bluetooth speaker in our car and we synced up and we did the pink yeah. floyd thing that was an interesting experience too i did jokingly say to her the other night when we watched it because i'm a huge pink floyd fan and and subsequently she has become as well yes um i'm not sure if you're a pink floyd fan or not um but i i realized i had seen the beginning of this film with the dark side so much mm. that i couldn't remember the last time i'd actually watched the beginning with the actual... <laughs> Just the film? The film. Yeah. yeah. So it's a little thrown <laughs> off. I'm like, wait, where's the, uh, you know, plane sounds and <laughs> the woman yelling in the background? Um, but yeah, sorry. Well, I so, digress there. No, di- digression's always very much encouraged. But like, you know, so I, you know, you have an incredible way you first saw this. We're kind of like, you know, shaky on our memories. But like, it, you know, obviously, without a doubt, like this, this film has had like... it. There is no denying the influence it's had on, like, cinematic history. And I think also no no denying, like, the influence it's had on how most people perceive, like, what a, like, a wonderful film should be. Mm-hmm. Like, the idea of, like, the story that she goes on, how it's shot, how it's filmed, and it holds up. And, like, it's that gen- it's that really great generational film where it's most people get exposed to it at some point or no references from it. So let's talk about this incredible film. Should we start with the opening credits? Yeah. Absolutely. They're great. That overture. (laughs) I mean, listen, and this is like, you know, kind of the happy, I think, thing about talking about this film and also kind of like the challenging part is like you could talk about every like minute detail of this film and how perfect it is. But starting with that overture just fills me with all the feels. For the dreamers and all of us or says or something like that. Yes. The young in heart. That's the one. Young in heart. I don't know if I were, I mean, has there ever been an, I'm sure there is, but I, I, I don't know another film that's ever done that where it dedicated a film to the book, to the source material mm-hmm. and to the to the audience. That it was just it's a really beautiful and brilliant way to just start any film. Well, and it's also too like, you know, so obviously this is if you're if, if you're listening and you didn't know this, this is Bill's based on the uh, children's novel series that was there written are books? by L. Frank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> L. Frank Baum. Um, you know, there these were, you know, beloved. MGM had re- acquired the rights to these. Actually, Walt Disney did try and make Wizard of Oz, but MGM already had the, the book rights for it. Um, although there is a fun Disney connection in this movie. Do either of you know it? I do. Go, Anthony. Uh, and if I only had a heart, there is a voice that goes, 
beautiful, aren't thou, Romeo? That was not good. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. no but, notes. <laughs> but that uh, voice is Snow White, and it is the only time. Uh, yes, yeah, the voice actress who did Snow White is the only other time her voice is heard, other than in, in Snow White in the Seven. Wow. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. yeah, you guys just both dropped some knowledge on me on that one. That. How yeah, could and, you not know that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's right. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's like, and, and, and it's like that interesting connection. You can understand, like, why they wanted to make this film, you know, as tremendously big as they did. Because it had such this, like, moment to be, like, such, like, the, the technical innovation of Technicolor, of being able to bring the story to life. I love the, you know, an Alpha Rank bomb, like, and so many of those are so, like, interconnected in this. Oftentimes you have, like, those source material, the author kind of gets, like, left in the dust. But I think, like, that opening dedication speaks to how much they wanted pe- that the author to be honored within mm-hmm. the work instead of, like, subsumed by the work and just, like, a footnote to it. Um like, you know, for example, like the great story about um, the coat that's used for the wizard. Do you guys know this? The, so they were the idea behind like the wizards, like costumers. So the costume designer, uh, Adrian Greenberg, um, he got his start. He so he became like a, a contract person at MGM, but got his start because he did such great work in Gold Rush. He did like the costumes for Rope and Philadelphia Story, mm-hmm. like incredibly prolific. Never won an Oscar, but incredibly prolific de- costume designer. So when they were designing the wizards like attire, he was like, the coat should look somewhat shabby chic, like as though this is a coat that at one time was pristine, but no longer is, but still looks just good enough. So it could almost trick someone in like, so the whole idea with the wizard and like that it could like, almost like trick someone to thinking like that they're of like the noble class. Mm. So they sent, like, you know, the costumes are like, we need to find, so they're going to all these consignment shops, all of these places, they were pulling coats, trying to find something, trying to find something. And then the coat that they settled on, so the actor put it on and opened it and, and embroidered on the inside was L. Frank Baum. So they ended up being able to trace this. It was actually his coat. They had no idea when they bought it. This was a complete like moment of magic. And then they restored the coat and gave it to L. Frank Baum's widow yeah, at the awesome. conclusion of the production. <laughs> awesome. So in that way, like he was so much like a part of this, which is incredible because you don't always have that. I do have a quick question for both of you. Yeah. Do you have either of you read the books? No. Okay. Bad English teacher. No, I've (laughs) never. You know, and it's not for lack of interest. I know we'll talk about this towards the end of the episode, the idea of, like, the sequels or, like, kind of continuations of the story. And, like, I think I want to at some point, but I don't know. There's something, like, just so perfect about this film that, like, I almost don't want any other experiences. As much as I'm, like saying it's incredible how much they dedicate the author to this work. Like, I almost, like, don't want anything well, like that. Well, let me say our friend Kristen, um, who, you know, really nice fan of the show and, and helped us with getting Nostalgia Cinema, or, you know, her and I were talking to us recently about this, and, and she had made a comment, essentially, like, Wizard of Oz is one of those films that legitimately, it kind of, I don't want to say takes away from the, like, I, I don't want to misquote her, but essentially, this film... Trans- kind of takes away from everything else. Anything that comes after it, anything that came before it, it's so perfectly done mm-hmm. that it's kind of its own thing. Like, you mm-hmm. can't yeah. beat it. You can't do anything better than what you already have. Not that I couldn't continue to pour over the overture, which also films, please start doing that again. That's so, such a great mood setter. Like, it needs to come back. I know people don't love lengthy opening credits, but I love a lengthy opening credit. But that might be the the Turner classic movies thing. So in the Kansas sequence and this like, you know, incredible sepia toned like scene setting, do either of you have like a favorite part or like a memorable part of like this opening part? I mean, the most basic of answers is somewhere over the rainbow. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they almost cut that. Like that was cut. That was cut from the film originally. There was discussion because they said it slowed down the film. We got to get to <laughs> Oz, and I'm like, so absurd. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I, you know, I saw this interview on uh, on uh, the American Film Institute. I forget with who. It might have been with her daughter Lorna Luff, where she said that. Somewhere Over the Rainbow was that combination of the perfect song for the perfect person at the perfect time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just, the, the song basically says, I am not going to believe there aren't, there isn't magic in the world. There isn't more out there. And the song speaks to the dreamer in all of us, yeah. you know? So uh, I 
love that song and that moment. I think when I think of the Wizard of Oz, if I had to pick my single favorite moment, it is that part. Oh. So yeah, that's such a great moment to pick. I think there's always this moment where she grabs onto the wagon wheel and just kind of lets her mm. body drift backwards. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know if you were choreographed to do that or it's just what you felt like. But there's such like a, I feel like. It's not performance. It's just like they capture yeah. this moment where she's like so within the song and so experiencing what this could mm. mean. And like, you know, if you think about the scope of Judy Garland's career, if you think about Judy Garland in this moment and kind of what the set was like and what the atmosphere yeah. was like in MGM, I'm like, this felt like this young woman imagining like all of the possibilities of what things could be. It's so beautiful. I just feel that it doesn't. The movie doesn't work without that song, in yeah. my own opinion. No, so, yeah. right? Are we talking about it? You know, whatever. What are we at? Eighty years now? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, yeah. math is hard. <laughs> Eighty-three. <laughs> Eighty-three. Yeah. Um, years later, um, you know, I, I know. I think it's, it's still the whole film, but yeah, that. It, it that note when she first hits that first I mean it's just chills even mm-hmm. every time you watch it no matter how many times you watch it it's so perfect and because like you were talking about the perfect person the perfect song Judy Garland's voice is so distinct it's so her own voice yeah. and mm-hmm. it's just it's so powerful do you know that I mean I think like we might talk production history a bit but my understanding is originally before Judy Garland was cast there was discussion of Shirley Temple taking on the yes, role yes there was yeah and like I mean, I think Shirley Temple's great. She doesn't have the vocal abilities of Judy Garland, you know? Like, how did... What what happens to this song if yeah. if, if Shirley Temple had to sing Gets it? cut. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or they just, like, change the notes and all yeah. that, you know? So. You would have to change the tonality of the yeah. song because I'm thinking about if you can hear her voice in your head singing, like, Good Ship Lollipop, like, that's a totally... And so, you know, and obviously, so, that you know, in, in the novels, like, Dorothy is supposed to be younger. So, mm-hmm. like, Shirley Temple would have been the appropriate yeah. age. My understanding is when they were doing the auditions, like, that was the thing. They were like, she doesn't have the vocal ability to carry this movie and although it would have been maybe a more appropriate age and like you know there was a lot done to kind of hide that you know that Judy Garland was 16 Mm -hmm. like a lot with like kind of like compression for her chest like but I also think in some ways I'm like I don't know I've just always thought of Dorothy as 16 like I've never and I know that's not what she is in the novels but because of the film like certainly but I also think it's there is you talk about that this almost got cut completely I am glad they cut it from one moment um, and I'm sure you both know this, there was, she's supposed to sing a reprise of it when she's in prison. Yeah. Uh, after like the witch leaves her. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad they cut that because it's such like a hopeful song. I feel like that would have been a really sad moment. And the song already does make me mm-hmm. a little like, like in a good way, blue, but if it, you add that layer of like, she's sad and she's missing home and now she's trying to like reconnect to Kansas. I am, I'm glad they cut it from that spot. But cutting it from the film would have been tragic. Well, that's, it's just this, you were talking about the bee and the dreamers, and that's why I think it works so well, because it's, as you get older, it just, it takes on new meaning, mm-hmm. and every time you hear it, yeah, it's just, I, it's the best part of the yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> And it's so hard, because it's like, in so many ways, like, there are so many incredible moments in this, and like, the set decoration, and the costume design that comes later, but it, it but it's also this like, but when you think of this movie, don't you just kind of come back to that moment in yeah. that song? Um, I have to ask you guys, because I was thinking about this a lot when we were watching it in preparation of the episode, um, do you have a favor between Zeke Hunk and Hickory? As Zeke Hunk and Hickory? Yes, Thank you as, for asking. That was my oh, question. As Zeke Hunk and Hickory. Because yeah. <laughs> that answer might change if they yes. are. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Between the three, um, I think between those three, I think Zeke might be my favorite. 100%. So. Agree. <laughs> nice. Yeah. His comedy is so great. Yeah. Yeah. He's so <laughs> playful. Although I do think that um, Hunk, who's the scarecrow later on, mm-hmm. if you're if, for anyone who's not following, I liked when he calls Miss um, Gulch a ghost heifer. <laughs> I don't know why that really made me laugh this time. Maybe because like, because I th- like the insults, but he's also, it's interesting because like Hunk is so much like harder on Dorothy in so many ways of like, kind of like, you got to get your head in the game. Whereas like, I think I agree with you guys that like, Zeke is so much kinder to Dorothy, like in this like opening sequence where she seems, you know, she'd be going through some stuff. She wants to like imagine a different life for herself in so many yeah. ways. Hickory, he doesn't have a lot in this opening, if oh, I remember. No. Yeah. No, he just kind of smiles and does like the head tilt thing that he yeah. kind of does the whole time. He's the tin man. <laughs> But I also like, I like that, you know, in this, 
there's like so much like nice like chemistry and there's so much like care given like with these three characters especially then with the decision to like obviously cast them like within like Oz as well but I think it establishes them so nicely and then like because I love because there's such this nice interplay and you have Auntie M who's kind you know she's trying to be somewhat of like a disciplinarian and then you know you get Miss Gulch who's terrifying I'm still freaked out by Elmira Gulch still to this day as a grown person she freaks me out I, well, you were talk, we were talking about Over the Rainbow, but I love just that stark contrast at the very end of Over the Rainbow to go right into, I don't know if there's actual yeah. title for the witch or <laughs> Mrs. Gold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing. It, I'm sure it has a name, but you almost like don't have to say it because you can hear it in your head as soon as you like think about her maniacally like talking about killing a dog, <laughs> which I have to think you don't like. I don't. <laughs> it's actually the one thing I'll say about the movie that they leave unresolved. So, <laughs> yes. oh, right. When she gets back. Yeah. yeah we, don't, we don't see, like, Gulch get, like, her comeuppance, you know what I mean? Or, like, anything. But if you see the play, they do, like, if you do, if you see, like, a live musical production, they do resolve that at the end. But the movie leaves it out. Sorry. What's the resolution in the play? Oh, they say we're keeping the dog in F off, basically, kind of thing. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I think maybe they go to the sheriff and get it, like, approved. I, I saw, like, a high school production. Right. Like 10 yeah. years ago but I like to think that still plays out uh, in The Wizard yeah, of Oz I, I think we all because feel because otherwise you know I have to ruin the movie for everyone that loves it <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to imagine an ending where like right after this Gulch comes and they put the dog down you know by the way I mean? audience uh, Wizard of Oz we have spoilers if you if they <laughs> should oh. <laughs> also if you've never seen it we're coming for you it's been um, out for 83 years we're not sorry <laughs> can I can I just say though I've always imagined that she died in the tornado God, your version dark. I always imagine yeah. that Miss Gulch just dies. I mean, I, I sounds so bad to say, but for the sake of Toto's life, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm a bad person. Listen, this nobody. Video, this was recorded. Nobody is writing for Elmira Gulch in this room or who's listening. Like, I think it's fine, but that's how I've always imagined. I imagine she gets back and they find out, like, she died. Because okay. she's on a bike when the tornado comes. Like, do we think she gets to shelter in time? All right, maybe we're lingering too long here. We can move on. Uh, poor Margaret Hamilton who uh, played Miss Gulch. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I do love the behind the scenes of this that, like, Judy Garland talked about because, like, Margaret Hamilton was, like, so incredibly kind. She was, like, never really, in like, she wasn't intimidated in those scenes because she was, like, she was just such a nice woman. And that, like, I love that it's actually, so Margaret Hamilton and Judy Garland both tried to convince the owner of Toto to give them, to give Toto to them because they loved the dog so much and grew, and particularly, like, they talk about, like, Margaret Hamilton grew so bonded to the dog. It was, like, really dumb. And, oh, actually, I think even more particularly Judy Garland, obviously, but I always thought that's, like, a nice behind-the-scenes yeah. turn. She didn't actually hate dogs. So, Anthony, I gotta ask you with Toto, best dog ever on film? That's a good question. So, I have to say, yes, but no for me. Like okay. Maybe in the actual okay. world, yes. 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 But I have a special place in my heart for Shadow and Homeward Bound. Uh, my golden retriever as a kid was named Shadow. Shut yes, up! Yes, uh, because of that movie. <laughs> and the end of that first movie, again, I cry movies with dogs. When you don't think Shadow's coming out of that sewer... <laughs> And then he runs over the hill at the end after after a moment where maybe he's not going to because we see Chance and then Sassy and then Shadow, come here, boy. And then nothing. And then he slowly comes. So Shadow. But then Toto. All right. But everyone else would say Toto. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand. Uh, see, I was thinking Benji, but yeah. No, I'm with Shadow. Anthony. Right. Shadow. <laughs> you have emotionally you... hit Lauren here, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You didn't want my eyes are fully watered as you're describing the end of this movie, which I've not watched in some time, and I literally jumped out of my seat when you said Shadow, because that's all I was thinking is when you asked him that question, I'm like, no, it's Shadow and Homebird Bound. That's the only answer here. <laughs> I will say I do think Toto's the smartest dog, because without yes. Toto, they she would have never gotten back. Like, Toto, Toto is just like Idiot humans pull the curtain. Like, you know, like Toto's got no time for them not being able to figure this out sooner. Toto's like got the wizard's number like from the beginning. He's like, you smell like that one guy who had a cart. I've got this. <laughs> Toto's kind of complex. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so we have the, you know, we have the great tornado comes, uh, which, it, you know, if you don't know, it was like a, it was a nylon stocking that they stopped. We can talk about how uh, what? Professor Marvel, he kind of just like... You know, he was a complete fraud and, like, still a... <laughs> but a nice fraud. 
He's not malintentioned. He was not. But, but he, he let her go out into the uh, storm. Oh, wait, okay. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he did. Well, she does run away. That's true. <laughs> I do appreciate that he's like, I think this girl maybe ran away from home. And there is that moment where you're like, he probably thinks, how involved do I have to get here? <laughs> right. She seems old enough. He does come to check on her in the end, though. So he gets, mm-hmm. a, he gets a pass. Yeah, but it puts his head in a stranger's window. Like, that's a bold move. I don't know what Kansas was like in the I was 30s. Say 39, it's probably just very normal. <laughs> this is fair. Um, but, you know, you get the great tornado sequence. You have, which is an incredible set piece of how they did this. Like, you know, especially like you're thinking special special effects now. I don't think it would be any mystery to any of us of like how you'd be able to accomplish that. But certainly then, you know, with the prop miniatures and, and the nylon stocking and like having to like, you know, create what, you know, for I think of its time. But even still today, I still buy as a tornado. And then you get the great reveal of her opening the door. And we're in Oz. It's <laughs> it's that. It's so perfect. Like, it's such an incredible... Like, is there a better cinematic moment? I don't know that there is, but I, I'm willing to hear thoughts. I mean, I think it's the greatest moment in film history. I think it's the moment that, honestly, probably, I think, st- still packs the same emotional punch as I remember as a kid. And I don't think there has been a scene in any movie, I think, that still hits me as hard as when that thing opens. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah. We're, again, we're talking 83, you know, 82 or 83 years later. And yeah. it's just, just the brilliance to know how to do that and mm-hmm. to set that up. And that the colors are just as amazing yeah. when that door is just opening. It's, yeah, you don't get any better than that. <laughs> no, and I also, like, I think about, like, what do you, you were talking earlier about, like, when people, you know, come to Frank Banco Ale House Cinemas and they're seeing, like, Jaws for the first time on the big screen and, like, how, you know, jealous of someone who gets to do that for the first time in a theater and I think I'm like I I, can you imagine being in 1939 and you're sitting in a theater and that happens like with what films were prior you know what they looked like Mm -hmm. what they were able to achieve which is incredible like incredible technical innovations but I can't even imagine the feeling of going and watching that film probably you probably never saw a trailer for it or not you just go and then this thing happens like I can't even imagine what that felt like Let's invent a time machine, like, right now. Like, I want to go. I want to sit in the theater on opening night when that first thing happens. I have to imagine that was, like, so incredible. I want to do that, but go to the test screenings, because the movie was originally nine minutes longer, and the footage doesn't <laughs> exist. So I would like right. to... Wait, is that the... What is it? The Jitterbug? Or it was the, that in it? Or? The Jitterbug, um, the Somewhere of the Rainbow Encore. Um, there, There is one scene that's al- still alive that was extended that you can get the footage on, on like, a, the DVD or the Blu-ray. If I only had a brain has like a five minute extended dance sequence in oh, it. Oh wow! Okay, uh, I'm actually glad they cut it because it really does slow down the film. And it actually, <laughs> in a fantasy movie, feels a little too over the top and exaggerated. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I get it. Um, but and I know if you watch one of the trailers, there's actually after they kill the witch when they go back to the Emerald City, there was supposed to be this huge celebration and party scene and an encore of the witch is dead. Um, if you watch one of the trailers, you can see about six seconds of that footage, oh, wow. but they cut it. It's all <sighs> dead. Well, and that is like the weird thing too, of thinking about like a film that has been so monumentally important to like film history. The fact that the original version of it does not like pristinely exist is mm-hmm. kind of incredible within itself. I also find it's interesting. I mean, that they were still doing, they were even doing test audiences as far, you know, mm-hmm. back then, yeah. uh, to know where or to, to know where to cut and everything. I mean, I imagine for something like The Wizard of Oz, where, you know, it's this innovative thing and they're they're doing things they haven't really done before. I imagine they want to get some opinions on right. the movie, yeah. you know, yeah. so, yeah. Well, and think about that, like, that's something that, like, is kind of well documented in the film Singing in the Rain, the idea of, like, when the producers come together and try to figure out, like, is this thing going to sell money? Like, and yeah. it's weird to think about, like... Again, like, you know, there was, I remember reading that there was, like, a long-held thing that, like, Wizard of Oz actually was, like, one of the, like, it wasn't successful at the box office, and they were like, that's actually, like, not true, like, that it, it's, it was, like, modern, it's just comparatively speaking to its legacy, maybe, does not seem. I think what I've heard is, like, it did okay, I don't think it was, like, a blockbuster in the way that, like, Star Wars came out and was a blockbuster, yeah. like, Jaws, I think it did fine, it probably did as well as other big movies did at the time, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, but like it didn't do like Gone with the Wind levels, I, I right. don't think, you know, and I think it's just the word of mouth of that movie and through television and Thanksgiving apparently, uh, you know, it's just, uh, we have discovered the film. Every generation introduces it to the next. It's, it's in my opinion, like the movie that 
if I were to ever have children, you know, and they say, what do you want to show your kids first? That's the movie I would want to do. I think a lot of parents would probably think that. Like, mm -hmm. this is probably the safest movie I can show to yeah. kids <laughs> that is also kind of scary because there's flying monkeys uh, and an evil terrifying. witch. Terrifying. Terrifying. Well, kids got to learn sometimes. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> Safe know. terror. It's rated G, so <laughs> like... <laughs> but I think I'm glad you said that because to me, I mean, and I don't think I'm inventing the wheel by saying this, and we've talked about top you know, top ten films, top five, you know, these things. And I agree with you. For some reason, I sometimes leave it off my list. But at the end of the day, it is, it is, to me, I legitimately think it is the greatest film of all time. And I think it's all for the reasons you're talking about. It, it just plays to every audience. It does. I mean, we you can sit there, we'll watch, you know, these horror retrospectives, and they'll put that put this on there because of The Witch. Or, like, mm -hmm. you know, it's a musical, and it's comedy, it's fantasy. I mean, it's drama. Like, it just fits every box. See, like, the witches I'm fine with. Like, the witches okay. It's the monkeys. The monkeys are not okay. <laughs> My brother is convinced to this day that he had a real encounter with flying monkeys. I'm sorry, <laughs> Mickey, so if you're listening to this. I'm so sorry for telling it's everyone. Amazing. Uh, no, so, like, my father, when I was a kid, I don't quite know the full story, but... Either he had, like, a very on-the-side gig uh, working with, like, waste management and, like, garbage company. It sounds yeah. like he's in the mob. He's not. Uh, <laughs> he was a carpenter and a construction worker. <laughs> Painted who, houses. Yeah. I, I hear you paint houses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, who sometimes did things with the, the dumps, you know? Uh, and my brother swears that one day we drove into the dump and he got attacked by flying monkeys. <laughs> For years he would say this. So sorry, Nikki. Uh, but he's like, they were real. I swear. And I go, dude, you made like you're, it's not real. But I, to this day, I don't know. And to so. our audience, please uh, tune in in two weeks when we have Anthony's brother on. <laughs> <laughs> that is not what it's happened. Not hear this story. <laughs> maybe he was like, maybe he had an entrance point to Oz. Like maybe, maybe we should be hanging out at Dumps. Maybe yeah. that's how we get into Oz. Because like. You know, when the scene opens and you have this, like, you do, you have this beautiful contrast between the sepia and then the technicolor. And then, you know, she walks out and all of a sudden all these, like, magical things start happening. Mm -hmm. You get, like, all these, like, tiny micro communities of, like, lollipop league or lollipop guilds and lullaby leagues and this beautiful costumery, like. Murder enthusiasts. Because they're all thrilled that the witch is dead. Right? Yeah. That, that song is, like, it's so joyous. Yeah. The, 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 like, the, the, the beat of it, the melody. But, like. The lyrics are dark, so... Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Well, but it's so important. <laughs> no, I'm glad you said like that, that because I put that in my notes as well when I was watching. I was like, they are very joyous about... I mean, I understand she evidently was ruling with some type of, like, you know, fear, but at the same token... She had it coming, yeah. I guess. <laughs> like, she did have it coming. <laughs> I think you're to think she has, like, killed, like, members... First off, Fair. you... You get the sense, like, the lollipop, like, guild looks really, like, angry, and we just think that's, like, the vibe, but yeah. I think it's, like, there were more members of that guild. Because they give her, like, one lone styrofoam yeah. lollipop, like, that doesn't, that to me a guild does not make. Like, I think you need at least eight to make a guild. That's what I'm calling it. I'm saying she murdered some of them. That's the last of the guild. <laughs> <laughs> just the three of us. And that's why we look so pissed off. Yeah. We're, we're open to new membership. Yeah, like... <laughs> All right. <laughs> You're like, we can talk about that too. <laughs> but I love she like. She really has those bags. <laughs> I honestly, I realize I have created these imaginings in my mind of what I think Wizard of Oz is that now I'm having to say out loud. And I feel like I sound like a psychopath. I'm like, well, Miss Gulch died in the tornado and so did a bunch of munchkins. Like, to me, it's like death and destruction in this movie. I love, I just want to, the parents that sometimes have their kids listen to this show. <laughs> would love to be in the cars. You know, <laughs> somewhere out there I'm now envisioning that, like, I think this film's on HBO Max, that, like, there'll yes. be a Wizard of Oz cinematic universe <laughs> where we'll get, like, the gritty R-rated guild story. <laughs> and then it ends literally with, oh, a house dropped on this witch up. Let's see who did it. And then it just ties into the Wizard of Oz. Listen, it wouldn't be shocking. Like, the production history of this alone is so kind of terrifying and yeah. threatening. Like, so many people almost died on this set. Yeah. Like, all right, you know, so obviously, like, there's the tragedy of, like, you know, the pills that were given to Judy Garland and... the and, We're doing and, the hold-up now? Uh, no. We're doing <laughs> well, the hold-up, aren't we? A little bit. But Do you know like, about the hold up on our show? 
No, I don't. Okay, so we do a segment on the show. And we'll, we'll, let's just move through this quickly. Yeah. <laughs> or, or now, I mean. Um, so we do a holdup, because every so often we'll come across a movie that we want to talk about, but there'll be a scene or something about the movie where we're just like, eh, that does not hold up well in, in 2022. Oh, I've, I've heard this. Okay, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So... Unfortunately, The Wizard of Oz, we have a couple. Um, and I think, uh, yes, the treatment of Judy Garland is obviously probably top on that list. Well, yeah, I mean, because, like, you know, certainly, if you don't know the history, you know, watch the film Judy. This will go into it a little bit. Or, you know, just, you know, Google a, a, <laughs> right. any documentary about her. Um, you know, so there's that aspect of it. You have, um, you know, Margaret Hamilton. They set her on fire, like, <laughs> by accident, of course. Mm-hmm. Like, not, like, it wasn't one of the munchkins or anything, but, like, like, they set her on fire. You have the fact that the scarecrow, what was it? It was like a year after they finally, the last time he took the makeup off, he still had the lines in his face because the pressure of the prosthetic oh, really? stayed with him for a year. I think. Well, yeah, Buddy Epstein was supposed to play the Tin Man. And then almost died. And then almost died mm-hmm. because the makeup was, you know, yeah. toxic. His vocals uh, are in the ensemble of We're Off to See the Wizard. So really? when when the Tim Man's not doing a solo, yeah. it is actually Buddy Epson. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So he still gets to be in the movie in some capacity. I'm sure that yeah. felt. <laughs> you can see pictures of him, and yeah. like you know, I do wonder that because also like uh, I don't know if you know this, but Margaret Hamilton was not the original person offered Wicked the Wicked Witch. It was actually uh, I didn't know that. It was Gail Sondergaard. Um, Gail Sondergaard was like a classic Hollywood beauty, mm-hmm. uh, and she originally and you can see pictures of this online wanted, and this was originally how it was going to be, the witch was going to be more of like a, a bit more glamorous, like kind uh. of imagine the evil stepmother in Snow White, like, and okay. that, that's what her yeah. makeup looks like, and then they decided they wanted to make the witch a bit more frightening looking, <laughs> and she's like, I'm not on board for this, so she left, and oh. then they, Margaret Hamilton's agent's like, hey, they want you to play a part in Wizard of Oz, she goes, sure, what is it? Mm-hmm. And then the agent's like, uh, the, the Wicked Witch. What else? Yeah. So, you know, there's an interview where she says it. She's like, fine. Yeah. yeah. So. But I mean, like, you need someone menacing. Because she is menacing yeah. and terrifying. Like, I, I I make jokes about the monkeys that may have attacked her brother. But, like, you know, it's really, she's terrifying. And, like, and I think that makeup, because you need that staunch, mm-hmm. like, difference in the colors. Like, there is something so interesting about the fact that it's ruby red slippers and she's green. You think about, like, that opposition right there. And, you know, and certainly she suffered for it because that's her makeup, although she wasn't poisoned from it. It had it was copper-based, so she could only be on a liquid diet because she couldn't ingest the makeup by accident. And then additionally, on top of it, it was, like, months after her skin was still tinted green because they couldn't get it off. And, like, you think about this, I'm like... We love this movie so much, but people's bodies really went through stuff for this. You know, the, I think the set temperatures were what, like a hundred degrees because of the lightning or the lighting. We're talking about these beautiful colors. They they came at a cost. So the Wizard of Oz is tough in that way. Well, at least it's, you know, the suffering has endured, you know. Suffer for your art. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I do have a question for both of you because maybe you guys know, maybe you don't. I was thinking about this. So the witch being green. Is the Wizard of Oz, which kind of put that as our thought of what a witch looks like? Or was that something that was prior to Wizard of Oz? Like, was the Wizard of Oz the one that kind of gave us this idea of what a witch looks like? I mean, as Kermit the Frog would say, it's not easy being green. (laughs) Um, But uh, I honestly, Ryan, I don't know the answer to that. Because I I honestly always associate with green. And maybe it's for the reason you said. So, yeah, yeah, Lauren. (laughs) So her visage in terms of, like, the shape of her face is actually because in the documents that were used um, in the early part of the European witch trials, a document called the Malleus Maleficarum, um, that was the image of what a witch was. So how her hair looks, her hat, and, like, the shape of the prosthetics they put on Margaret Hamilton's face, that is entirely, like, taken from, like, the Malleus Maleficarum. The coloring, I believe, is unique to Wizard of Oz, and I think if you trace it, like, that's... Because, like, oftentimes what was discussed with, like, witches, like, during the witch trials didn't have to do with, like, skin tone necessarily, but, like, the shape of the face um, and the costumery that was worn. So, no, I think if I look back properly, because I was looking at some of this recently um, to teach the Crucible to my, my high school students, I believe that green thing may be from the Wizard of Oz, that that's why we associate it that way. All right, cool. 
So European witch trials. Like, <laughs> what is with my side of the conversation? I feel like you guys are having a really nice conversation about Wizard of Oz, and I'm just over here like, death. Woo-hoo. I appreciate, you know, we were talking about Margaret Hamilton, and I always love the story about the fact that uh, she ended up going on to Mr. Rogers mm-hmm. um, yeah. because they wanted to show kids that were so terrified of her the, what an actor was and that she was just an actress. Um, and I just thought that was such a, that's such a, such a cool story and such a cool move by everybody involved. Um, Because I don't know much work of hers outside of Wizard of Oz. We saw her recently in 13 Ghosts, the original 13 Ghosts, uh, which was really cool to see. Um, But do you, are you aware of? She was in, I'm pretty sure this was her. Uh, I saw this movie, it's like a heist movie with Sean Connery from the 70s called The Anderson Tapes. Oh. Um, And it was been a year since I've seen this, but basically they have to break into this one room and steal something. And I believe she and another woman, and this is like in the 70s, so uh, basically they have to break into the house or apartment of these two senior citizen women, uh, and Margaret <laughs> Hamilton is one of them, uh, and steal um, this, I think it was money? I, it could be gold? Yeah. I don't remember, but she's... Broom. Yeah, right. <laughs> what, this this? Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that is the only <laughs> other thing I've ever seen her. And any other things I've seen have just been like video interviews of her talking about the Wizard of Oz. So, got it. Got you it. know, yeah, yeah. And that was Sean Connery. He's from that um, Indiana Jones Last Crusade movie, right? That's the guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. You know, we're having a we're having a nice chat. Why you gotta trigger him that way? Um, can we move to Can we move to the introduction of the Scarecrow? Because I'm excited to talk about the Scarecrow. Is, so we talked about this earlier of, you know, so I'll ask the two of you, you know, Tin Man, Scarecrow, or Cowardly Lion. Do we have a favorite? Scarecrow. Scarecrow is my favorite character in the thing. Actually, I, and when I was younger, I used to do theater, like in high school and a little bit in college. The Scarecrow was the one role I always wanted to play. And, and when I was 23, this local community theater uh, did The Wizard of Oz. And I thought about auditioning with the girl I was seeing at the time said she wouldn't date a guy who did theater. So <gasps> I didn't do it. And she, then I, You well, know, she probably didn't like some like it hot either. She didn't. I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was young then. Um, but then I watched the, that production and I was like, I could have done it better. Anyway, I'm sorry. I got very sad here. <laughs> <laughs> I think you would be a great scarecrow. I do. I Thank think you. you. Yeah. Hold that off. Because I have awesome. no brain. <laughs> <laughs> Walked right into that one. <laughs> I think the lesson we learned is he always had a brain. Yeah. That is true. We, <laughs> I think we had that conversation. I said something like, for the scarecrow, he's kind of smart with some of the things he does. <laughs> Lauren's just looking at me. I went, that's that's the whole point of the end of the yeah. movie, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What's your, who's your favorite? I mean, I, I'm not going to have an answer, the reasoning as good as yours, so but happy. it's the Scarecrow. Yeah, I just, I mean, I just love the relationship and the, the bond and friendship of him and Dorothy. Um, Lauren talked about the comedic aspects, and I think she'll talk more about that in a second. But like, I just I find him, you know, he's just lovable. And it's like, and it's different. Like, we talked about him being, you know in the real world to Oz and, and everything. It's yeah. He's just a lot of fun. I love that song. And I will say this. I think the makeup they do, I know he ended up suffering for it, yes. but I was really watching it this time. And I'm going for 1939. I mean, even today that would be amazing mm-hmm. makeup. Mm-hmm. Like nothing against the lion and the tin man, but there's a little bit more of the time. Like his is so good. And yeah, so that, that that's mine. You. Right? I, well, okay. So I, No, because I don't want to be, like, a dissenter. Mine is the Scarecrow, too, for all the reasons you both have said. Like, there's such physical comedy in in that opening sequence with him. I can understand why there had been a longer dance sequence, because how he can move his body is so incredibly, like... Yeah, there's, like, a magnetism to it. You just want to watch him, like, sway back and forth. Although, like, I think as an adult now, like... I get the cowardly lion. That present anxiety, like, really sings <laughs> once you're in your 30s. You're like, I get you, man. I get how you feel about everything. <laughs> cowardly lion wants to sit on the couch and not go anywhere. I can appreciate I, that I now. I think that my, honestly, like, sometimes I jokingly, if I fake cry, will do this, like, oh, <laughs> And I think it's because of the <laughs> Wizard of Oz. I think it's because of the lion. <laughs> like... Because that's how he does it, though. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was like, really good. So maybe you should be doing that part. <laughs> no. Scarecrow. Scarecrow is also just like, you know, and I think in a lot of this scenes, like, kind of, I don't want to say the voice of reason, but like, 
He puts his foot forward a lot, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, keeps things on track a lot. He's, yeah. he's organized, you know. He's like, hey, let's not hang out in this poppy field too long. Let's wake these people up because it's snow. We got we got Oz to get to, you know? Yeah. So. Well, I know that's so great because he's so much more the person, like, driving things forward. Mm-hmm. Like, in many ways, like, they all look to Dorothy that she, like, she's the hero. And I'm like, it's really Toto and the Scarecrow, man. Like, Scarecrow. Because, like, I also think, like, because he has that great moment, too, with, like, the the angry apples. What yeah. are the angry trees and the apples? The angry orchard. Angry <laughs> Wait, is that why it's called that? <laughs> now it is in my head. That's why it's called that. This video is presented to you. By. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, I think there's, you know, because he's the one who's like, oh, I don't want those apples. They have worms. And he's like, no, they don't. Like, and he's like really great at outsmarting. Also, I will say, I do find the trees not scary, but reasonable. Like, how would you like if someone came pick things off of you? And I'm like, right on trees. Right on. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you bring up a great point. Um, but, like, there's a, yeah, the Scarecrow's just so great, and I think the, in some ways, the, their kind of, like, intro songs, I think his is the, is the most, like, engaging. Not because it's first, I just like the lyrics mm-hmm. to it the best of all of them. Yeah, I think of the three, it's, it's by far the, the best musical number of the three of them. Yeah. And then we get to meet the Tin Man, who's just out there mm-hmm. rusting. Also, like, is Oz terrifying? <laughs> Like, that he's just, like, you've got munchkins getting murdered in one land. You've got this, like, community on the right, hill that does let people... you guys have created that narrative. <laughs> why else would they be so upset with her? And there's a right. tiny munchkin genocide <laughs> happening. I like, want why it to else? be true. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, like, justify her death at the end. Um, but, like, you know, you have, like, he's just, like, out there in the middle of nowhere. And then I'm like, where are your people? Was he... Cre- like, I have to know. Like, do you guys think he was created? Is there, like... A grouping of tin men and women? Like, I'm curious. So, so here's the people? thing, and I don't know if, and this is, you, we t- you're talking about sequels and spinoffs and other things. Jeez, sir. I agree with you. I want this to be the only thing. I actually do not like Wicked because uh, mm, of the yeah. plot holes it creates with this. Yes. Um, because in that, I think it's like a munchkin who is just like hanging out too long or something, and then they like curse him and make him a tin man. Yep. Don't like it. Uh, but anyway, um, I like to think he was, like, the runt of the litter, and his family, you know, weren't thrilled with his performance, (laughs) and so one day he's sleeping, and they all just kind of packed up and left, and kind of moved the oil can far away so he can't get to it enough to give them a head start. (laughs) No? (laughs) That's so twisted! (laughs) I love it! (laughs) He's just like, oh, family. He just like wakes up and like, it's like, I can't move and I see my family yeah. is gone. Oh like, no! Like maybe if the can was here, he could just like lean down yeah. and move it like there. So it's like, you know. Doesn't he say he's created, that Tinsman created him? I, oh, I feel terrible if I did not pay close <laughs> attention. Oh. No, he does. You're right. Yeah. So, so then the Tin Man and his family were probably like, you know what? This may not be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. We're creating a human. There's a reason I'm not yeah. giving him a heart. I've read Frankenstein. I know how this goes. He right. might be a monster. Right. We're leaving. Yeah. Deuce is Tin Man. Yeah. He, he, I, you know what? I completely missed that part. I think it's because, like, I was, as we were watching this past time, I'm like, and he's, like, laying there, and I'm like, oh, I remember that vibe. Like, I had a back brace and a spinal fusion, and I'm like, I was the tin person. Just Oil <laughs> <can>. <laughs> He said that to me one time about my spinal fusion, like, no life, full stop, and I'm like, I'm not rusting. Thank you for still being here. <laughs> it was funny. I got mad because I was like, that is kind of hilarious. The worst was one time I fell on my, my back brace and I couldn't get up and I was rolling around like a turtle and my brother just came in and laughed and pointed. He eventually helped me get oh, up. But much like what happened to the tin man. <laughs> so I really relate to that yeah. sequence. Oh god, let's move to the cowardly lion. <laughs> oh wait, no, we first get the wicked witch with the fireball. Yeah. That part's terrifying. She says yeah. Mm. Like that's a that's a threatening space for the scarecrow to be in. She's got fire. That's another scene that was cut. That reminds me because she says in that scene, I'll turn the tin man into a beehive. Yeah. She turns him into a beehive. Oh, it was okay. Cut. Oh. Yeah. Uh, well, I wonder what that looked like. I'm glad you said that because that's actually something I was thinking about. I'm like, she only really kind of does anything to the scarecrow in that scene. Got out for him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe they were jilted lovers. It could be, yes. You know. <laughs> you didn't call, scarecrow. <laughs> yeah. Did you see Pearl? 
I have not seen Pearl. Okay, okay. Or, or I'm just going to leave it at that. I want to. <laughs> I'm waiting for X to come out so I can watch There's them back There's a scene in that with the Scarecrow Pearl. that you're just like, oh, yeah. see that whole differently now. <laughs> it's funny you say that because when we talk about recasting this film, yeah. that was almost who I cast as the Wicked Witch because of uh, that. Because yeah, I saw I something. But anyways. Okay. Um, I have thoughts on that. We'll get to it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so this brings us to, we get introduced to the Cowardly Lion, who is hilarious. I like when he does his little song. I mean, I know this is like later, but when he does his song, like when they're about to go into the the wizard and he does like they put the cape on him. And I don't know why I, I'm not going to replicate the noise. His little like growl just delights and tickles me. <laughs> yes, yes. That wasn't it, but yeah, yeah. close enough. <laughs> it was a good Chewy though. <laughs> like, and this might be the prototype for Chewy. Um, but I like the Cowardly Lion's introduction. He's just freaked out by the world, which honestly, from everything we've seen in Oz, can we blame him? Mm. I gotta say, I, I know we're jumping ahead, but you talk about the the, the musical number with the lion. It's yeah, one of my least favorites. <gasps> I actually do. I will say, I think that is the one that actually does slow down the movie. And if you were to cut something, that could be it. I still like it. So. <laughs> See, mine's more from a standpoint of like they're just breaking vases at this place, just picking up the you know their guests there. But he. Not- he breaks the vase in the most baller way because he, he breaks that. it and it looks like a crown. <laughs> he did do that. But he didn't clean up the dirt that was left there. And yeah, that's... There are two scenes that I, I always go... Or my That one and I when they're in the twi- when she's in the twister, um, I, there's something about that portion that I'm not a few, huge You're on fan your own there. I <laughs> love that. So, But but no, I like to imagine... You now. like uh, Dan coming on the, the rocker? Yeah. All right, all right. I'm fair with it. That's fair. I like that. Part. I just was. At, <laughs> but, What's wrong with you? <laughs> but I like to imagine there's some executives sitting in the theater watching the film, and it gets to the King of the Forest number, and the one leans to the other, and he's like, "You want to cut somewhere over the rainbow? <laughs> keep this." <laughs> and they're like, "All right, we'll keep it. It's fine." <laughs> Are you saying this was this was like an oath of like you can keep your King of the Forest, but then we're keeping somewhere over the rainbow? Like yeah. it was like. Oh, I love that imagining, as though they're, like, just sitting there with, like, probably, like, chain-smoking cigarettes mm. that are laced with asbestos or something, and then they're, like... Speaking of asbestos. <laughs> oh, yeah, the poppy fields. The poppy fields. <laughs> poppy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, a really great scene. I mean, the way that oh, they, you know, they mm-hmm. they set that the poppy scenes up and, and everything in the look, but now knowing that the snow is asbestos is a little <laughs> jarring. Yeah, and it really makes you think, like, we're really lucky we have Judy Garland as long as we did because right. everyone was really working to make her die a lot <laughs> earlier but it is like I love that scene what what I have to like you know and we haven't talked about this um I don't think there is anything that I both find so much joy in but also mechanically can't understand like their little hop and skip when they like go down the yellow brick road as a foursome like you know that little like kind of like hop and skip I try and do it and I did dance for years I can never get my feet to do it that way so I don't know like what barbiturates they gave all of them to be able to do that but it's like pure magic (laughs) it's a weird kind of twist turn from there but you were talking about that and I think that's this this thing that makes this movie magic even though we're making some jokes here um there's so much iconic imagery throughout yeah. the entire movie. Like, you talked about it at the beginning where we, we kind of didn't say much at the opening credits because it's genius. And, and and I'm just thinking about that. Like, just one scene after another, whether it's a quote, a song, or the four of them walking. I mean, who doesn't, can't visualize the four of them going down the yellow brick road like that? Well, yeah, even you're talking about, like, the, the poppy seeds, like, the running through the poppy seed field and then, like, her laying down, like... I love that moment. You you say somebody to follow this, and then of course you're going to start saying follow the elder bro. Like there, there's just so much to it. Yeah, is the poppy see what? Like what is the most iconic sequence in this film, other than somewhere over the rainbow, which is like the, I'm the best. I'm to Anthony on this Anthony. One. I mean, I think maybe honestly, it, it's the simple. We're off to see the wizard. You know what yeah. I mean? Like when the four of them are together. Yeah. I think yeah. that leading up to approaching Emerald City. I think when I think of images, I think of just them doing that in my I, that's me so no I don't deserve I have to think it's that right because it's like the image of it is just so like I think like it's yeah, if you're talking scene I mean I would maybe argue if we're talking just the ruby red slippers themselves are probably 
the most iconic thing from the film. But There's no place like home. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh! Yeah, we're all... <laughs> I haven't seen this movie like 200 times. Why would I not? Yeah. Because it's all perfect and iconic, I think is what happens. You know, because like even you think about that, like, I, you know, you picture the four of them like heading towards like Oz, like that's like such a like a crucial image in the film and it's so beautiful. And then even like the sequence within Oz is great. Although like, I'm going to say like a... You know, I, I, I'm always wary of any community that walls itself off. Although it's like... It's Probably just, from all those witches that are what? flying around. If they're as like, terrifying as stated mm. so much that one is killed and everyone's like super celebrating and then the second one dies and everyone is equally as happy... Like, you have to wonder if that's why they're walled up. Is this like a Wakanda situation and the Emerald City is actually vibranium? They have guilds to protect. They do (laughs) have guilds to protect. I appreciate when they get into Emerald City that the Emerald City is so, you're not, like, they have the exact spa treatment that a tin man, a scarecrow, a lion, and a human from Kansas need. Listen, there is someone in the Emerald, service. C- Emerald City who's like, I told you guys we were going to need this. You thought I was crazy. But look, don't we need this now for a tin person? Or it's like the uh, Shaun of the Dead where like, they run into their doppelgangers. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yes. It's That's- like... Dorothy and like Dottie, and then there's like they just <laughs> sync up, you know. It's like you just saw all oh, your yeah, different yeah. people. Come on in. Yeah. I'm a lion man, and you're a cheetah man. Yeah. Like yeah. Like, this is a, actually, you know what? That's that's a scene I want to imagine was in yeah. the original cut of this to explain this. I still think one of my favorite things is the horse of a different color. Why? Because you like jello crystals being put on defenseless yeah. animals? <laughs> no, I just, I visually, I think it's just, I mean, you're right. <laughs> Let's, the real story <laughs> aside. Well, no, no, and um, I should say they weren't harmed by it, though. Right. Like, they just would lick it off of themselves, <laughs> and that's why they had to keep reaching them Sounds amazing. Yeah. If you want to change me <laughs> into <with> jello? <laughs> um, no, I just think it, it's, again, just on screen. I just, I remember as a kid thinking that was the coolest thing in the world. Oh, it's a great special effect because mm-hmm. they cut it in a way that, like, you know, obviously you know what the trick is, but, like, it never it never gives itself away as to what's happening. What? I don't know what the trick is. <laughs> well, it's just... The, okay, all right, never mind. <laughs> I just want to say, though, like, I think that is why also this film just has this legacy and just works so well even now that, like, because everything was practical, like, I can't find the effects in anything. This movie mm-hmm. still holds up and works exactly as it did in 1939. You know what I Which mean? Which is just remarkable, yeah. to, you know, mm-hmm. to think about. So they come out of this spa, which is just, like, an incredible place. I love the costume. Again, like, Adrian Greenberg was, like, so... I, so many aspects of this film that were robbed at the Academy Awards that year. That's definitely an area in which, like, it was robbed. Because, like, it's such, like, a... Like, what I love about the Emerald City is it's so fully realized. It's weird that they're all just standing there when they arrive. And I have so many questions about what's happening in this city. But it's, like, so perfect. And then you get that really, that threatening reminder of the Wicked Witch's present with the Surrender Dorothy. And it's supposed to say, if memory serves me, it's supposed to say Surrender Dorothy or die, right? Was it? Yes, like no. there was a thing they cut off of it. Or what is it good for? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's because so what they did is like I, the technical innovation. Oh, of this I'm glad is, they cut that. Surrender Dorothy alone is just it's terrifying yeah. because it implies death. <laughs> you know, she's writing it across the sky. sky writing is is a real power move, right? Yeah, like, yeah. if you're writing something in the sky, you really want people yeah. to see it. Who's not at the beach and sees that plane, you know, sky mm. riding, and we're all like... Like, oh, what is it? And then you're like, oh, that's terrifying. Yeah. Um, but, like, so how they did that... I don't know that, what beach is she's at. <laughs> it's like when you get, like, the... Okay. Beach. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just awful. Um, but how they did this is they took... Uh, it was an ink bag and a hypodermic needle and a miniature witch in a water tank. And I swear I am not making any of this up. That's how they were able to write it. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you looking at me like I'm making this up? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm, I promise. I just Do I sound a, like Stefan from I just had an SNL? inappropriate joke. It's all. <laughs> No, it was not the hypodermic needles they were using on Judy Garland. That, that was the joke you were going for. But, like, I even think about, like, they knew that they wanted this shot, and they knew how threatening it would be, and they are like, well, how do we do this? Because there's only one scene in the entire film that wasn't filmed on a soundstage, and that's the clouds at the opening. 
that's it. That's the only thing that was actually shot like practically outside and then everything else was interiors. So the fact that they came up with a way of like doing this, although I would imagine if they had actually done this as proper sky writing and you're just like in LA, like it's like a Tuesday afternoon and you look up in the sky and you see Surrender Dorothy in 1939, like that's got to freak you out a little bit because you're like, who's Dorothy? Why must she surrender? It's, it would just be an interesting moment. I guess it'd be 38. No, no one else is picturing this in their mind. Okay, yeah. moving on. <laughs> Talk about the sets. I can. I mean, this is going to be a really you know broad question, but what's your Anthony? What's your feeling about the sets on this? I mean, they're amazing. Right. Uh, my my favorite set piece is actually the uh, towards the end of the film. It's actually the escape from the witch's castle. Like oh. when they are actually like running up and down outside, and you see them yes. on the top. I like am still blown away by how cool that looks. Like I'm almost like. I feel like they went to an actual castle. They didn't, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like, that to me, I think I, my favorite set piece in a movie, honestly, so. Yeah, I mean, the fact, yeah, I, I think, again, just looking at it, you know, I know that I love this film, but it's like looking at it to talk about it on this episode and looking at it in a different eye of, of you know, kind of the appreciation of what I love about it. Mm-hmm. And that was the thing. I kept just watching these sets and these pieces and just thinking about the fact of what they built there in, in, thir- in the late 30s and, and how it holds up. Like you were saying that earlier, like mm-hmm. everything still holds up, you know. You know, yeah, every so often you can kind of a little bit, you know, with the the background and stuff like that. But even at that, it, it gives it its charm and it's the way that it's done. It's so brilliantly. And I, yeah, I love the fact that you said the castle because I don't think that's something that gets talked about no. uh, up there. I mean, every uh, all these other scenes, but I think that castle mm-hmm. one is it gets a little left out and it's so done, done so well. Well, because they had to really invest in that feeling like a looming presence because it had to feel malicious. It had to look so different than everything else that you've seen previously in Oz. Like, you think about like the importance of like the colors in Munchkinland, although there's a lot of them, like, but they had to be toned in such a way that the yellow brick road really, really stands out. And then obviously you get to the Emerald City and that color, you know, map feels so important of like how the different tonalities of emerald are used and then by the time you so when you get to the witch's castle it's like it's immediate even it you know you feel the looming nature of it just because of like the plot but alone just looking at it it's like oh this is such a visual difference and because of that dorothy looks so different in that space because like her you know the white and blue of her dress stands out like so freakishly compared you know, the to the dress was not white and blue I did actually know that. Uh, Do you know was, what colors it was? It was uh, what, blue and light pink. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because of how it had to be toned with, like, the Technicolor, which is, like, you know, another, like, you know, kind of fascinating thing about this. Um, you know, then we get the entrance of the wizard. Do you guys find the wizard scary in this moment? Is the, it just... The great and powerful? Wizard? Yeah, the great and powerful uh, Oz, yeah. Oz? Um, the funny thing is, is I used to... Now I find him more mysterious because no one has ever actually come out and confirmed if that head is played by Frank Morgan. Mm -hmm. It's like the one thing that has still not been technically cast. So the mystery behind it, I think, actually scares me a little bit. (laughs) So that's that's my story. Could be Buddy Ebbs. Yeah, it could be. No, I agree. Um, I... I don't know about scary. I think again we're talking about these set pieces, and that's a piece, that's a set piece to me that is just so well done and so cool mm-hmm. looking. And if you plop that into a film today, I wouldn't think anything of it. I wouldn't go, oh, this looks like an outdated or bad. Like it's just so good. Yeah, I mean it's gorgeous, and like, and I think it's because I love like how Dorothy because like. Dorothy's scared. And, like, and I think one of the things that... I mean, Judy Garland. I mean, like, I I know we could talk about her endlessly, like, throughout her career, certainly. But I think one of the things that she does is she... Her vulnerability feels so strong. Like, she's not afraid to show that she's scared. It's not, like... It's not this, like, abject terror of, like, what you would see maybe, like, in a horror film with, like, a final girl. It's more, like, no, I'm 16, and I'm in a strange place, and there's a giant head talking to me in a threatening (laughs) way who's, like, get the broom. Like... You know, and it's kind of like the scary, but there's just something about how she plays that. And I think it's like, and I think it's also this cool, like, democratization that happens amongst the four of them. Because all four of them are scared. Like, that's supposed to be the Cowardly Lions thing, but they're all freaked out. And rightfully so. That moment feels so, so domineering. And, like, it's so, 
exaggerated and kind of like grotesque mm. in so many ways and like what's the one that uh dorothy says back to because uh, he's like i'm the great and powerful and she she says something like i'm the small and meek." <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely love that <laughs> and, and we're all just like same dorothy same if a giant head is talking to me i'm gonna feel pretty small and meek myself yeah. Yeah, I, I'm glad you said that about with um, Dorothy, because I don't, you know, because of how we're talking about it, we haven't really dived into too much about the the just how amazing that character is, the character of Dorothy. Yeah. I mean, we've talked a lot about this, like, um, and we're going to talk about it from the film standpoint, not anything going on outside the film, but, like, that character is such this character of, again, we use this term a lot on here, but agency, this female yeah. character of agency who, you know is caring and good and smart and, you know, forward thinking. It's just a really just genius character. I just. Well, and I think too, like, I think there's like, you know, this is another reason why this becomes so iconic because it's really easy. I think for any of us to like, um, you know, kind of project ourselves onto Dorothy or feel like Dorothy is a projection of like, you know, how much of like our adolescence is really spent like going, when I'm older, this, or I want to go here, or these are the adventures I want to have. And then you get to a certain point in your life and you're like, all I'm really looking for is like a longing for home. And like, that's such a complicated thing to unpack about the human psyche. Like in this film where we all know that is like the most iconic, Mm -hmm. there's no place like home, but you know, you we all have to go on that journey of understanding what that line actually means, which is why you, know, you talked about the emotional nature of this film. And I think it's like why it can in some ways get more emotional when you've hit that transition moment of going, it's not really about being out there. It's about like finding like some sense of like peace, like in your home space, like, and she does that so well. And Judy Garland was 16 when she had to portray all of that. Right. Like, and I think that's what makes Judy Garland's performance. Like Utah, there's a lot of layers to that character and that's hard to bring out in this character you know, that could kind of turn into one note, but it isn't. There's so yeah. much complexity yeah. to her. No, true. Anthony, I'll ask, because I know you to be a massive Judy Garland fan. If this isn't your favorite Judy Garland performance, what is it? Star is Born. Yeah. It really is. I mean, th- right this is my favorite Judy Garland movie, but <laughs> I, when I think of, and I don't think I mentioned this when we did our Oscar videos, but this to me, I think, is one of the biggest Oscar snubs. Is that, <gasps> yes. Is that Judy Garland did not win Best Actress for A Star is Born. That went to uh, Grace Kelly for uh, The Country Girl. I've seen that film. Eh. <laughs> I've seen her in it. Eh. Like, I, Judy Garland in A Star is Born is raw and vulnerable and just... There's so much emotion behind her. And also, you think about where she was personally in her life at that moment. That's like. True. It just hit. I literally, she gave her entire heart and soul. I think it's one of the most heartfelt performances I've ever seen, to be honest. And not that the Oscars, not that things need to be measured by their Oscars, <laughs> but she should have one. Well, no. <laughs> Did she never win one? I don't think no, so. No, she didn't. Yeah, I'm no. almost positive for that fact. Yeah. Like, but it's also like, too, because like you think about, and I agree with you entirely about the Star is Born thing. Like, that's, I know, a conversation we've had before, but like, she should have been rewarded for this too. Or like, I even think about like, I'm, I'm sure I'm not saying anything that you both wouldn't feel like this is not what Victor Fleming should have, like he shouldn't have won for Gone with the Wind. He should have won for Wizard of Oz. Oh, I agree with you on that one. <laughs> like, I definitely do. Um, I mean, 1939 was a great year in general, but yes, this film should have won Best Director, Best Picture. I don't even think she was nominated for Best no, Actress. No, I don't think she was. Yeah. Did this get that. many nominations? Well, so definitely did for Best Picture and Best Director. I'm trying to remember the other ones. So I Victor Fillman was nominated twice? Yeah. Okay. He got like six or seven yeah. nominations. And that would have been a 39 with uh, Mr. Smith as well? No, Gone with the Wind won. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, but Mr. that was Smith probably was, up yeah. as well, Mr. right? Mr. Smith, Stagecoach, Stage Coach, that's Wuthering right. yeah. Heights, okay. uh, Dark Victory, some other films. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Some ones that like have not hit, like they don't become those like canonical, like where there are a lot of like 39 films that do, but not like, yeah. there's like a few odd, like outliers in there. Uh, yeah. Mice and Men, uh, I think Gulliver's Travels. Goodbye, Mr. Chips was nominated. Well, that one I don't think I've ever heard of. Oh. Goodness uh, me. That, so look it up. It's basically about like a, it's kind of like Mr. Holland's Opus. It's like a school teacher through like his entire career. Oh. Uh, but the man who, I forget the actor's name, but the man who's the lead in that won Best Actor at the Oscars. And I think is, people say like, you know, people always think that Clark Gable should have won for Rhett Butler, but this guy beat him. You know, I think he's like the one, 
I think I read that Clark Gable is like the one actor from uh, Gone with the Wind nominated who did not win. So oh, okay. I could be okay. wrong on that because may- maybe Olivia de Havilland was also nominated for Best Supporting Actress but lost to Hattie McDaniel. Yeah. But I, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is I think he, Clark Gable, in terms of acting nominations, Gone with the Wind did not win Best Lead Actor and I think it's because of Goodbye Mr. Gibbs. So. Wow. Anyway, that, we got to put that on the list. Yeah, we do. Especially for you. Yeah, <laughs> especially for me. <laughs> it's Teacher fine. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so going back to Wizard of Oz, you know, which, you know, was denied a lot of glory. I agree with you. Not that the Oscars, you know, have to be the determining, but I think... But I'd like them to be. <laughs> yes, exactly, 100%. <laughs> but in, in a perfect world, they yes. would actually <laughs> reward, like, the best films of that year. We might need to bring you back here in... Uh... In, in February, March? Feb- uh, March I can't this remember year. what year they are this year. Okay. Yeah, so it's in uh, March. What month, I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's early March, though, so it's it's they're moving back towards that February uh, time. Mm-hmm. Although I have kind of liked the delay. It gives them, you know, kind of some singularity away from the other award shows. Um, if you so invest in the other award shows, that is. Um, I do. <laughs> I do know this to be true. Um, you know, so we, you know... We pick back up with these characters and they're, you know, making that walk through the woods, you know, the wizard or sorry, the great and powerful Oz has told them like, you know, to go off on this like quest, sending them into like absolute danger. Um, How mad do we need to be at the great and powerful Oz for doing this? Is he is he redeemed by the end? Are we angry with him? Because I mean, like they almost all die. Because of this dude. I was wondering when we were going to get to that, if we were going to get that to the end of the, the film or we're doing that now. He sends them into certain death. He wanted yeah. a broom. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my man and was so trying dusty. to keep his yeah. secret identity as... <laughs> but, like, literally sends these four, like, innocent people, like, to death. Because, I mean, from everything we're to understand is, like, she's a terrifying presence within the community of Oz or the land of Oz. So he definitely sends them to die. A child and some en- enchanted <laughs> objects and creatures, <laughs> like, you know... They, yeah. they do it. One of them has a gun. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> yes! Yes! They don't Scarecrow's use it. Scarecrow's got a gat! Like, like, yeah. <laughs> why don't you shoot someone? Yeah. Shoot one of the monkeys that's taken. <laughs> I hate guns, but like in that moment, <laughs> it literally. But the gun looks like the gun from the Island of Misfit Toys that shoots jelly. Like yeah. it is literally what it well, looks like. Then let me see that fail <laughs> instead of wondering why the gun was not fired. Where did he get the gun? Yeah. <laughs> like, do you think like a citizen of Oz was like, dude? I don't think you understand what he just asked you to do. Just take this yeah. with you. And Scarecrow's like, no, man. Like I don't like guns. He's like, no, seriously. You haven't seen the monkeys yet. <laughs> like I love that imagined conversation. Question. Yes. You we didn't see it fired. Could it have been a water gun? <gasps> Could have been the game changer that we didn't know about. <laughs> I like that we've been just slowly writing a whole entire backstory <laughs> for this film that doesn't exist. I want to imagine an alternate ending now where, like, at the final scene when the witch melts, they have the gun and go to shoot her, but then it en- ends up being a water gun, and then she melts. Like, oh, that actually worked out. Well. <laughs> like, not what I thought, but cool. You know, like yes. there's that brief moment of them reacting in fear and then realizing it yeah. works. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and then the 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 power was like, I'm not gonna give a kid a gun, like a real one. Like, <laughs> the, the, line, psycho. the yeah. line get a weapon in that scene. I can't remember. Oh, so the Tin Man has an axe. Yeah. He's got a gun. He's got his tail, which whips around a lot. Is <laughs> it, it if, fly swatter? No, he doesn't. <laughs> no, he, they, they have a butterfly net. Yes. Oh, that's net. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what a weirdest assemblage of weapons like <laughs> I've ever committed to film. Um, but you know, this is you get the you get the assault by the flying monkeys. You know, um, scarecrows gets dismembered, which we you know just we put it back together, but I got to think that's a traumatizing moment Mm -hmm. when they're like, well, they threw a leg over there. They threw an arm over there and he's just like lying there. And then we get the capturing of Dorothy and you get finally this, like them in the castle and like kind of this message. I mean, she's going to drown the dog. Dorothy, I think has every reason to think that she's going to die and really looks like she's reckoning with that. Well, she she was somewhere over the rainbow. (laughs) (laughs) She knows she's going to die. She got the biggest hourglass ever to tell her how long she has to live. Dude, but also, like, and not, like, that I want to praise villainy, but that is, like, one of the most vicious and, like, stunningly impressive moves of, like, here's an hourglass. I'm going to tip it over, and when it's done, you mm-hmm. die. Like It's large, so there's just enough time for you to be rescued. But <laughs> yeah, you're real right. close. Yes. So. It's a very Bond villain move yeah. by her. <laughs> I, I do, I, I like that there is the line there to make sure that we understand why she has this time, so the witch is like, um... 
we have to do this just right so that the uh, shoes don't lose some of its power. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does give, like, a, there's a reason why she's doing this. <laughs> yeah. It's all, Well, I mean, we need, you know, for the film to happen, we right. need them to have time to get there and to be able to rescue her. But, like, this is where, like, I love that Toto gets away, and then Toto essentially goes and, like, is like, you know, fools, I've got a path up to the castle, just follow me. Like, mm-hmm. again, Toto just saving the day left and right. But they figure out a way to get into the castle to save Dorothy, so that way they can escape you know, with the broom. Um, I do like that they put on the the soldier's uniforms, which I wonder, does that invent that trope happening in future films? Like Star Wars? It, yeah! <laughs> that's used a lot! Like, it's, yeah. I know it's a device in, like... He comes into Dorothy and he, the scarecrow takes off the hat and's like... I'm here to rescue you. <laughs> the scarecrow, I'm here to rescue you. It's like pretty much what happens. Like, you know, they beat up the guard, which, you know, I'm glad they're plucky. Again, gun nut. They got user. jumped and still came out on top. Yes, so they did. A, a positive to them. Yes, they did. They're strong. Oh, I mean, one of them's you know a lion. What? Didn't need to use that gun either. They did not! <laughs> Um, which, you know, you gotta appreciate every moment of physicality, certainly with the Cowardly Lion, given that his costume weighed 100 pounds and was made of actual lion. Yeah, it's so crazy that they used actual lion. <laughs> I would they're... feel so weird. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like I've just been eaten. I'm like, trying to figure know. out, like, is it, like, like, on one end, it's, like, so weird, and on the other end, like, I, do you have to feel like the most powerful person in the world, right? I'm wearing lion like, I'm just today wearing lion to work. Skin. Um... Peta, please don't right. listen to this episode. To say, for the record, I don't actually think anybody should wear lion skin. Um, you know, but they bring in the castle, and then we get you as you highlighted so uh, you know fantastically earlier. We get we that. talk about the fact that uh, the wicked witch trolls Dorothy with showing Annie M. <laughs> Dude, that part is really messed up. Um, like it is because she's seeing like her brother, yeah. and she's like, "Man, look at you all sad about yeah. family." <laughs> oh, I miss my aunt. Like it really is kind of demented. I mean, the Wicked Witch. I mean, she's supposed to be Wicked. demented. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she fits her name. But we get, you know, they save her. We we have this great chase sequence, which I think works really well. Also, a cue for all movies to take your action sequence at this pace of beats, like because it, it, it's dynamic. It still feels like filled with tension. Um, and then you kind of get the moment where, you know, we think all hope is lost. They got the spears, like the pointy, pointy spears. And then, you know, the water happens. Does the water thing make sense? Why would you have water in the castle? All right. Unanswerable That's question. question Anthony. Anthony, why does she have water in the castle if she knows it can kill her? That's a good question. I've never wondered this, actually. Um, I have a theory. Go for it. The, uh, the um, her soldiers... Obviously didn't like her. Oh, they do turn pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. Did they have that there? <laughs> so they have just a random bucket of water. Well, there is they... a lot of fire in that. I mean, <laughs> at some point, you could. Gotta... They, they maybe just like maybe typically three, four times a week. The witch kills one of the guards, lights them on fire because they're not performing up to standards. <laughs> yeah. And maybe the guards are like we should just get some buckets on the standby <laughs> yeah. to put these fires out. <laughs> Like, and then this time it just happened to work against her. I don't know. Like, Does she maybe not know? I wondered that. I did wonder that. But she does yell out, no water, I think, right? Um, no, when she she's yells, melting. She just yells, oh, what a world. But I thought she said no water does or something. Did she say that. no water? I could be wrong about that, but I thought she does. But I agree with you. I've wondered that. Does, she, does the witch actually not know that she... Maybe they're, like, a day away from, like, a mutiny. Like, all right, yeah. she pulls this crap on us one more time. <laughs> right. <laughs> we're not, these buckets. We're yeah, there. that's it. We're not killing any more munchkins, and we're not killing any teenagers. Not on our watch. Maybe she just doesn't normally go down to that part of the castle, so they thought, that, thought yeah. it was safe. Oh, that's right. Well, because I guess they have to drink water, yeah. right? Yeah. Guys, yeah. we don't melt. Why should we right. suffer? Yeah. We need to hydrate. Like, yeah. Uh, hydrate or dihydrate. Like, <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> Quickie Witch is like, it's just dihydrate for can me. That, Thanks, guys. Can that be Nike's new, or not Nike, or Gatorade's new? Uh... Hydrate or dihydrate. I think I have to just, I heard uh, my, uh, well, someone from my staff programming specialist, Addison Young, I heard her say that once, uh, so I have to give credit to her. Right. So, so. One, 100% could hear Addison saying yeah. that, and two, I may put that on my board this week, guys. Yes. Hey, hydrate yeah. or dihydrate. Uh, As we go, go into this holiday season, <laughs> it's important to remember. Yeah. If you're partying on Thanksgiving Eve, <laughs> yeah. hydrate or dihydrate. Um, but, you know, so we get the killing of the witch, and then, you know, so, again, celebration throughout the land at another death. Like, a real death-obsessed mm-hmm. people. 
And then, you know, we go back to Oz with, like, the, the, the mission completed. The broom is delivered. Um, and then we get this great reveal. What do we make of the reveal watching it, you know, some years later? Do we still think it works? Do we like this part? Is 100%. it incredible? Is it? It is. I just always wonder, though, like, I always wonder if she could get back. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, that, mm. that's all. Like, I mean, I, I love the reveal. I yeah. always was like, I want to go have a dream and be as <laughs> vivid as this. But but is it a dream? Is it really? Well, you're, you, are we talking about the wizard at this point? The reveal? Oh, that reveal. I'm sorry. I, oh, no, no, no. No, because no, no, no. we do have to talk about that yeah. because there are two ways to interpret what oh. I've always had firmly what I feel is, because ha- there is two ways, I guess, to interpret the ending of this. But do we like the reveal that the wizard's not like. Sorry, I jumped ahead, my bad. We've been talking for two hours. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're okay. Um, the reveal of the wizard. Do yes. we like that he is just a, a common man, basically? Yeah. Uh, yes, an average dude. Yeah, I, I like it. I mean, it it's humanizes him. You know what I mean? I think what he says makes a lot of sense. I find it very heartfelt at times. Um, did he use the town to his advantage mm. by him through manipulation? Sure. <laughs> There's some colonial commentary here for being on this. Why it's a Thanksgiving movie. <gasps> oh. Yeah. Also, the one quick thing. He definitely has on like a hairpiece wig. And right in the corner, you can see it flipping up. There is a little flap. <laughs> oh, yeah. I stare at it every time. I will now yeah. forever see that. Be like, oh, I see your I hair. Still a masterpiece. Still a masterpiece. Yeah. Still perfect. No love- notes. <laughs> <laughs> I do love the reveal. I think it still works today. Like, every time you watch it, I still think it's, again, it's one of those iconic moments. I mean, I just was talking to my sister this week, and I sent her a gif of the, you know, ignore the man behind, behind the, the curtain. curtain. And Toto's like, enough of that nonsense. Yeah. Although I do, uh, I also appreciate and hate that the wizard um, still is just trying to gaslight them for a few moments <laughs> of, like, just ignore him. <laughs> He's yeah, not yeah. there. Yeah. This isn't my voice coming out of the speaker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's really totally different. To, I think that's why he's so willing to to take off with Dorothy, because I feel like once he knows the ruse is up, he's lost all of his power. Yeah. He's I like, I have know. to leave this place. Yeah. But I also, you have to wonder, how angry is he in the balloon when Dorothy's not in it? Like, do you think he's like, seriously, I went through all this effort. I had this nice gig. I was set up in a great city with an awesome hair salon. And now I just got to go back to stupid earth (laughs) and being normal-ish. Like, do you think he's like really mad at her? He's got to be. Keeping my wig. I like when he gives the, uh, he gives the scarecrow the brain and the scarecrow says, or, you know, the, and he says to him, um, how could I ever thank you? And he's just like, you can't. Like, how can I ever thank you enough? And he's like, you can't. You can't. My favorite is that he said, this is something, a phrase my dad used to say all the time, a doctor of thingology. <laughs> and like, like, I love how, and I love that he forgets. What's the word he forgets? I can't remember what it is. There's a word well, he keeps. A phlam- no, <laughs> <I'm gonna laughs> Philanthropist. That's thank what he's you, like. Yeah. Philanthropist. Um, you know, so, he, you know, he takes out, we, we learned that, you know, the power was within them all along. And then, and then he, it's it is. It's like so perfect. A heart is not measured by how much you love, but how much you are loved by others. Uh, so good. Twist the knife right in there. You were talking earlier about that, um, you know, the scene with the Tin Man saying and breaking his heart. Mine's always when she leans into the scarecrow and says, I'll, I think I'll miss you most of all. Did you know that there was, uh, a, they didn't film this, but originally when she goes back to Oz, when she wakes up, no Oz, she wakes up and she's, Back in Kansas, um, there was supposed to be a scene where Hunk, that's the scarecrow, Hunk is leaving for college and says, uh, we'll talk when you're older. About like like oh. like a hinting at like they're gonna date or something. Oh, oh. oh. but you're going a different way oh, now. No, no, okay. no, 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 it's okay. like a flirty kind Got of it. thing. Okay. Um, and I think maybe that line is supposed to tie into that, but okay. also like... Ew. Yeah. So, yeah. Because Ray Bulver is like 35, I think. I was going to say, I've made. never, I don't think I've ever looked at those characters even being close to her. Age. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I've always looked there. supposed to be yeah. like, oh, like, um, like older brother or uncle you type. When you first started saying that, I thought you were going to say that there was like, Hunk kind of knew that oh, Oz existed no, and that, was trying to. Uh, that would have made for a better ending. Yeah. <laughs> I think that would have been better, though, with the Professor Marvel doing that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. like so. hey, we're back here, but be cool about yeah. it. <laughs> so I'll ask then like you know so Dorothy you know we have the iconic you know there's no place like home the clicking of the slippers we're back in this like sepia Kansas world 
is this a dream? Does Oz exist? Like, what are your positionings on how we are to interpret the end of this film? I want it to be real. <laughs> you want it to be real, right? I think there's three dreamers in this room. So yeah, I think, I we think all. we're all going with the same <laughs> answer. It's hard for me to imagine as though like Oz doesn't exist because it feels so fully realized. I also think it explains why like the wizard is able to find her like to know where her house is. Like I think there's like stuff with it that to me makes sense. Um, it's a do- like a doppelganger realm, maybe that the three of them like exist, like meaning like Hunk, Zeke, um, and Hickory, that they exist there too in like different forms. I don't know. I just want Oz to be real. I want to think I can float away into some Technicolor dreamland. If Oz is real to you, it's real. To- it's real. You know. Exactly. I, it's real to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think we've spoken about this a lot. Like, Anthony, I'll ask you because I think you will speak uh, better to this than, than anyone in this room. What is the enduring legacy of this movie? Like, if you had to say, like, what's so important about Wizard of Oz? What? I think it speaks to the dreamer in all of us. Oh. And I think that is, this is a film of, of, you know, imagination and wonder. And I... It just works at any age, to be honest. So I like I, I'm. We're talking about this. I'm 32 years old in this movie. Still, I have the a, a, maybe a stronger emotional reaction yeah. to than I did when I was a kid. And how many movies can say that? You know what yeah. I mean. So, yeah, I, I think honestly, even if I were, even if I had not seen this film until I was an adult, I still think I would have a, a strong reaction to it. So. <sighs> No, I agree so deeply with you. Like, I think there is something to this. Like, I think there's, like, one way of reading this film where you talk about it in its, like, film legacy. Like, what it did for, like, the scope of cinematic history Mm -hmm. and, like, Hollywood films and that. And there's, like, that part of it. And then there's this other part of it of, like, it's the commonality of so many people know this movie. Even if you don't know this movie, you know this movie because it's, like, so referenced it's so monolithic in culture in that way Mm -hmm. but i think it's it really is that like how many movies can you say like it's not just about it being a favorite but it like keeps growing for me in different ways or keep like it it's emotional resonance like holds up over time or gets more emotional Mm -hmm. like there's so few movies that can really do that and i think in a lot of ways and i just feel that like it's the the gold star in terms of like this is a practical film with the most creativity and fantasy behind it. And we did this all real. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, how many... Th- and, and it all still holds up now. You know? Even, like, look, I love, 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 love... Probably in my top ten currently, the Lord of the Rings movies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? Uh, filmmaking at its best. But, like, looking back now, 20 years now, some of those effects don't hold up the way they <laughs> did. Still, yeah. masterpiece. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but, yeah, like... Yeah. The Wizard of Oz, every everything in that film looks breathtaking to yeah. this day. I, I can't find a flaw. So definitely not visually. Yeah. So And also if you're listening to some find a flaw, like no thanks. Like unsubscribe. <laughs> like we don't want to know the flaws of this movie. It's too perfect. But I think you're right, like in that way, like because everything had to be done practically and like it's everything there was tactile. Like I can only imagine like what it was probably like to go to set every day and you're just in Oz. Like it's not yeah. It's real. It, it, it's presently there. You can go up and you can touch the yellow brick road. I imagine that had to be an incredible experience just within itself. So this movie is perfect. I don't think anyone in this room or hopefully anyone listening would deny that fact. But, you know, that we always talk about the sequel, remake, reboot, uh, prequel idea, <laughs> like, you know, in the, in the in a fantasy realm, if a movie gets like another component to it in some ways. Um, but this movie has had sequels. Which make it kind well, of it's interesting. It's had sequels, it's had prequels. Um, it's had remakes. It's had remakes. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit all, I mean, it's had a little bit of everything. Um, Anthony, how do you feel about any of those things that have come out in relation to Wizard of Oz? I've tried to avoid most of them. Okay. Um, because I saw Wicked when I was 16. Fun fact, I went with uh, the Banger Theater Department. We went and saw Wicked, and some of the kids entered that lottery where you can get, like, cheap seats up close. Yeah. I got front row tickets to, to, to Wicked, <laughs> and I did not like it. Yeah. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just, I, I am someone who, I, and maybe this is why, I, I don't need origin stories for why the Wicked Witch is Wicked. I just want to see her be Wicked, you know what I mean? Like, that's better to me. I want the villain absolute, not, like, I don't need these backstories. Also, a lot of plot holes with how things connect to yeah. The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Like, in that, like, she ends up basically having, like, a romance with who ends up being the person who ends up being the scarecrow. Like, and it's just, 
I don't like it. Uh, I saw Oz the Great and Powerful, and that was not a Wizard of Oz movie. It could say all it wanted to be, but it wouldn't. I literally am just reminded right now, Daniel Moyer, I, I hope you're not listening, Daniel Moyer, but uh, five years ago, he let me borrow Return to Oz on DVD, and I've never watched it. So, yeah. Dude, so how dude. could you? I, <laughs> don't yeah, tell me I how know. could you not that. More people made that movie than have seen that movie. So... <laughs> Uh, I have just been like, you see, no, um, to me, Return to Oz is one of the best sequel movies ever made. That's uh, what I've heard. That's the funny <laughs> thing. <laughs> so, like, you're not alone. Yeah. I just, it is. It's listen. If you if you could take me in a different person and just watch Wizard of Oz, I would go. No, absolutely not. There should never have been a sequel made to this movie, um, or even an attempt at it. But the fact that I saw that movie as a kid, you know, I, I'm you know jaded with the fact that I've always had that sequel in uh, for the most part. <laughs> it is really good, and I think literally even you as an adult would watch that and really enjoy it. So whoever lent you it, one of these days you need to <laughs> just sit down and watch it. You're you're probably right. It's probably not a how could you, but it's one that I've talked with her about trying to do with our nostalgia cinema at some point, uh, doing on this show. It's so, it's a lot darker. Than, oh, oh, yeah. Than That's what I hear. <laughs> so, uh, but it's it like the girl from the craft, right? Far as your Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that first part of it and how she gets to Oz is really, even as an adult, I go, oh, somebody made this as a kid's movie, which is a, I guess it's considered a Disney property. It is um, a Disney property. Yeah. I don't know if Disney. it was at the time. I guess no, it was. I believe it was. It was like an offshoot. Um, I appreciate her, you know, Dorothy, I think it helps uh, or adds to Dorothy's relationship with the Scarecrow. Um, um, there's some char- interesting characters, uh, but yeah, absolutely. The rest of it, I agree with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the great and powerful, uh, or Oz, the great and powerful is not, I am with you. It's just not a wizard of Oz movie. It's not no. very good. Um, wicked. I, I like wicked on its own, its own merit, but it's trying a- to really attach it to wizard of Oz to me doesn't work. And I'll be honest. Like, so I read the book that was written by Gregory McGuire that inspired wicked, the musical, um, it's in, it's something. Um, it's a. Uh, it, it, here's the thing. It's very it's, different than the show, right? It's very, very different <laughs> than the show. Uh, much to the point when we saw Wicked, I went, "Oh, so we're just glossing over a lot of the really weird stuff he did in the book." It, they play it a little bit more like, "What if it just was a backstory?" And so you lose a lot of like what Gregory Maguire added to it. But I can't say that I think he added it successfully. Like you have to almost think about them as separate entities because like if you really think I think that's the thing is maybe you're speaking to is like if I really have to think about this thing as some extension of the original 1939 Victor Fleming directed Wizard of Oz, nothing of nothing should exist that connects really to that. But like when you showed me Return to Oz, I'm like, this is really weird. But I don't think about them together, if that makes sense. I think about them as like. Its own okay. thing. Yeah. If I could get to that, then I think I would enjoy it. But I've, I've struggled to do that. Yeah, that's things, fair. So. Um, the Wiz really deserves some a lot of credit for what they did with that. I mean, I do uh, enjoy that. I, it's I a love really the Wiz. Good <laughs> yeah, he's on top. He's yeah. on top. He's it's so catchy, and the Wiz is fun. Like it the is Wiz fun. Is really, yeah. Return to Oz is not fun. It's super fun, but it's dark. It's dark. <laughs> but, like, The Wiz is fun. Yeah. Like, The Wiz feels like it has, like, incredible spirit around mm. it. And it's got catchy music. It's a lot of fun. Do, you, do you either of you remember the... <laughs> Sorry. I really the like bad, the movie. Do sci- not apologize. <laughs> the bad sci-fi miniseries. <laughs> I think it's now bad. I don't Tin Man. The Zoe Man. Nation Yes. I have not seen it. I remember not watching it because I was uh, concerned. Yeah. Was little... Concerns were warranted. Yeah. <laughs> Concerns were warranted. <laughs> and I think you were kind of excited about it. I was excited yeah. about it at the time. Um, I think I even like convinced myself at the time of watching it that I was enjoying it. But it's one of those things that like once you get seven, I'm like, nah, it wasn't very good. <laughs> so sequel, remake, reboot, prequely things aside, don't don't mess with the 39 Wizard of Oz. But like you know, so there's been some fun iterations. But if we could imagine like a fantasy casting, like a we are tasked with you know remaking or redoing something with Wizard of Oz. Do either of you have picks for like who your fantasy cast would be for the Wizard of Oz? Well, I love hearing his takes on this part. So I would love for you to go first. <laughs> really? right. He does make it impossible because every time he like gives me the recasting during the episode, I'm like, I kind of want to like walk out of the room because his was good and I don't want to do this now. Yeah. <laughs> I believe there actually might be a new Wizard of Oz 
in production, so I will say that they're, I believe... pre productions <laughs> in Dicey State. Yeah, we'll I'm say. hoping that stays that way. Um, okay, so starting with Scarecrow and Tin Man. Oh, God, I know where this is going. <laughs> Scarecrow, Bill Hader, <laughs> the Tin Man... <laughs> Ben Schwartz. You just can't help yourself. I want to say, (laughs) I actually agree with you, but I would have put Bill Hader as the cowardly lion. Yes. I see him being that emotional wreck, personally. But yeah, continue. Sorry. (laughs) Um, If not those, if we couldn't get those two, I Uh, would go with Andrew Garfield as the Scarecrow. Oh, it'd be great, And I would go with Lin-Manuel Miranda as the Tin Man. Oh, that's great, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's some fire casting. The I would go with Dan Fogler as the Cowardly Lion. Shut oh, up, that's so good! I take so it back what I said. Yes. Yeah, I take it back. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Um, I would... Sandra Bullock as the Wicked Witch. Oh, yeah, I could see that. I could, I could see that, yeah. I kind of want to see her be villainous. Mm. That'd be cool. I was torn, really, on the wizard. Um, I decided... I, 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 this is going to be a stretch one. Chris Rock. A little bit oh, of a different, yes. Because I think he, he can balance comedic and dramatic and, and find a little a bit of a balance there. Do you know what answers to that? Do you know what role I think like really speaks to he would 100% kill that is Rufus and Dogma. Yeah. The way he plays Rufus mm. and Dogma okay. yeah, totally yeah. speaks to All what right. you're saying. And then uh, my Dorothy, I would uh, probably, uh, I, her name is uh, Sadie Sink, uh, the girl from. Oh, um, oh. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good casting. Yeah. All right. Does it work? Does it, work? it works. It works. <laughs> it works well. Do you want to hear my casting? Yes. Okay. So for my Dorothy, I have, she's not been in a lot, uh, but it's an actress by the name of Kylie Curran. She was in Dr. Sleep. Um, she oh, played, yeah. yeah. So she is the main girl in Dr. Sleep. And if you've not seen that, see that movie. Um, my my lion scarecrow tin man dynamic is really funny in consideration of yours. So as the tin man, I'd have Anthony Ramos. <laughs> as the scarecrow, I'd have Tom Holland. <laughs> so it's just weird that that's how yeah. you paired yours. And then I would have the lion as Aquafina. Because I just can't <laughs> picture her. <laughs> Picture Aquafina. That, that, that did not work with Anthony. <laughs> no, I, it's actually funny. I, I like it. I can see it. Yeah. I like yeah. Dan Fulger better, but... Uh, I do, too. Sorry, this yeah. is why I hate going after him no, with this. No, I like... I, um, your I Dorothy's would, great. I, I would have my Wicked Witch as Sadie Sink. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay. This, as you're doing your cast, I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> My Glinda, which we like, didn't even talk about Glinda, we like, did. this whole episode. <laughs> Billy Burke. Um, she was married to Ziegfeld. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. I did not know yeah. that. Um, I knew about, like, there was, like, a dramatic age difference between her and Margaret Hamilton, but I don't think I investigated much further beyond that. I didn't know that she... That's kind of... That's a great fact. Um, my Glinda would be Viola Davis. Yeah. And then my my wizard uh, would be Dev Patel. All right. Uh, I like that. You, you're... Well, I guess it's probably matches the ages at that time, but they feel younger. It is. They're all younger. <laughs> they're all younger. Like, and well, and here's the thing. I don't know how old those actors were in particular, but I did cast specifically younger because like, I don't know what it was, but I was just like, I was watching Glinda and her presence and I was just like, I want to see Viola Davis as Glinda. Cause I think like Viola Davis is one of those like actresses and I follow her on Instagram and every time she like pops up in my feed, I'm just like, aw. It's like, oh, I just feel comforted. Like, you're just going to take care of everything. Thanks, Viola Davis. Like, that's just how it feels to me. But your casting is always as fire. Anthony, right. I would love to hear this. Starting with Dorothy, um, this girl is, like, I think she's a teenager now. Um, she was in everything for a while, playing the younger version of everyone for a while, McKenna Grace. Yes! So. Yes! Yes! Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry, yeah. podcast audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, in terms of, uh, I would give the Cowardly Lion as Winston Duke. Yeah, um, I don't know why, but just seeing him as M'Baku just kind of gives me, That's like, really I could be the lion. Because he, he's very, like, big and intimidating, but I, I can see this gentleness in him, you know yes. what I mean? And you see him in Us, and he is, like... Oh, know, yeah. Yeah. Um... I, I kind of struggled back and forth with the Tin Man, but I actually really do like Ben Schwartz as the Tin yeah, Man. Yeah, I do too, um, yeah. But uh, 
So my scarecrow though would be Joseph Gordon-Levitt. <gasps> so stop. That's yeah. really good. Too yeah. perfect. Mm-hmm. He Too would, he would perfect. have that complete body movement for that. Oh yeah. yeah. For the wizard, uh, I like your answers better, but I would go with Robert Downey Jr. Oh no! So, incredible. Yeah. Oh, um, I love that. Yeah. He was at some point. I, I, and I don't know if I dreamt this up. Was he attached to Oz the Great and Powerful at yes. some point? Would have made that movie. Yeah. I don't know if it would have saved it, but I think it would have been a much different. <laughs> I like true. that. I like. Yeah. I agree with you. I think yeah. he would be amazing. Yeah. Um, in terms of the witches, hmm. Because my problem is, I always try and think realistically as if this could actually happen, and don't <laughs> want to spend too much money on a million yeah, yeah, yeah. So Glinda, I would give to. And I also just love this woman. Gugu Mabathara? Yes! Is that her name? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love her. Just this, like, class and grace yeah. to her. And yes. I'm a big fan of her acting. She did this movie called Belle, which is fantastic. And Beyond the Lights, you should definitely see. Uh, the Wicked Witch, I struggled with huh, quite a bit. Because it's like, I kind of wanted to find someone that I think could surprise people. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, uh, honestly, like... I don't even know if she could do the laugh, but I can hear her doing the laugh. Rachel McAdams. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. So. Oh no, I think that makes total sense because she, like, if you think about her performance in Mean Girls, no one has ever casted her in a vicious role since. Yeah. And she should, she can play vicious well. Oh, I so see that. Oh, so. Anthony. Thank you. Like, well done. I think you win the round. Yeah, Good you win. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I love you. No, that is... A, I want to see that version of it. For the record audience, you pointed at me, so I just... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, too. Um, no, but I just... I see, like, that casting makes so much sense, and I think that's, like... You think about those actors, and it's like you could so see how charming something like this would be. And again, like, I would never want to see this remade, but it's like sometimes you think about actors now in those parts, and you're like, oh, wait, there could be... There could be an argument here of seeing this version. Well, this has been so incredible. Anthony, we cannot thank you enough, but we thought that given that this is a a Thanksgiving episode, because some of us may still associate this as a Thanksgiving (laughs) film, or maybe watch it this time, or maybe this, if you're listening, maybe this encourages you to revisit it. If you've not watched Wizard of Oz in a long time, and you're looking for something to watch in the lead up to the holidays. So I'm going to ask everyone to go around, and Ryan, I will start with you. Um, Ryan, what is something you're thankful for this year? (laughs) Can I say two? Yeah, because you always have honorable mentions. Yeah. Even if- <laughs> <laughs> so I've, uh, yeah, uh, obviously, uh, I don't, I shouldn't have to be said, but, you know, family and yeah. obviously 100% you. Huh. Um, so always things that I am every day thankful for. Uh, this year, the things that I think I wanted to talk about really quick were just uh, time a little bit, which is like sometimes we look at that in a negative way. Um, and we just lost our aunt, um, a couple weeks ago and, you know, it was a tough one for our family, uh, as a whole. Um, and I just wanted to look at time in the way of being thankful for the time we had because she was just this beautiful spirit, spunky woman who just <laughs> was amazing and, and taught a, us all a lot about just goodness and, and being good people. Um, so I, I'm thankful for, you know, the time we had with her. Um, so, you know, and we'll, we'll certainly miss her. So uh, just thinking about her with that. And then the other I wanted to say was um, believing. And it kind of goes a little bit to something you were saying earlier, Anthony, you know, at the top of the show, which is just I'm thankful for, like, my parents allowing me to have the you know, the life to believe in things. And I think that's so important for all of us today. And we're going into this holiday season and it's just, it's okay to believe in magic. And my parents allowed me to have that opportunity to believe as a, as a young kid. And it's something that I've wanted to take into as an adult. And I think we, as a a society, you know, we, we, things are tough, but it's like, it's okay to believe in magic. It's okay to believe in each other. It's just, it's okay to believe. So I'm very thankful for that. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. That was nice. Okay, thanks. (laughs) Anthony. Uh, Well, first, I'm thankful uh, to, uh, I guess, MGM for making this movie. Yes. Yes. Um, Friends and family. Um, I'm also thankful for, I 
I don't get emotional about my brother a lot. <laughs> Love you, Nikki. I've called you out a lot on the show. I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, but my brother actually got married this year, uh, oh. and he was with his girlfriend for 14 years. Um, they met in high school, so like you know, they had to go through life together. But just seeing their you know their entire relationship. My family jokingly says that they like her more than him. Uh, <laughs> I think if they ever were divorced, that she'd get the family in the divorce. <laughs> so, but uh, I, I'm thankful for them and their relationship because honestly, like, it makes me believe like in the power of like real love. You know what yeah. I mean? Especially from such a young age. Yeah. Um, and also, like, I am just since I uh, before I worked at Arts Quest and I got introduced to programming and the cinema committee and just a whole bunch of different people i was very like on my own kind of thing you know like in college you meet people who like movies and stuff but then it was kind of me and i was at this level with just film enthusiasm just so much higher than everyone else and then i joined arts quest and i met incredible people that share my passion and it's just i'm thankful for that the fact that i can do this with you guys you know and it's it's so nice to have people whose enthusiasm is at my level. You know what I mean? And you might beat me in terms of Oscar passion. Oh, I don't like, know about that. No, I, I think you might. So, you know, you're telling people they can't can, can talk during the show. Like, we'll talk in commercials. Sorry, Lauren, I'm calling you out. Uh, but I'm thankful for it. So. But no, I, I'm just, I'm thankful for this community that we have in the High Valley that loves movies. Yeah. So, that's it. Thank oh, you. That's wonderful. Yeah. And congratulations to your brother. Yeah, and to his wife, new wife. That's amazing. That's yeah. wonderful. That's a few. I just like. I don't know that Give I. Give it a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I don't know that I can add much more. That you know, obviously, I think it's it's the family and friends thing. I think you you know both spoke to really beautiful things. Like I know you know it's. I think, you know, one of the things, whether you, you know, celebrate Thanksgiving or not, like, I think the the taking the moment's pause to, like, think about things that really are kind of, like, filling your heart and your spirit, like, it is so important to do, um, you know, so family and friends, I'm, I'm thankful we get, I, I think I'm always thankful for film, but I think in moments like this, when you can spend two hours talking about a mm-hmm. movie that, like, it would be so easy just to be a commonplace, like, oh, of course, Wizard of Oz is great, like, where's the discussion there, but it's like, these things deserve to be you know, talked about. So I think I'm thankful for discussion. I'm thankful for everything you said. I think, you know, the movie theater, I think for everyone sitting in this room, and hopefully a lot of you are listening, it's an escape because there's something beautiful about the power of story. And I think I will always, every year be thankful, but particularly in this conversation of like, the fact that so many people come together to make a story that's meant to comfort you or to enlighten you, to teach you something so you can feel reflected in something and go, that thing you just wrote or the way that line was delivered, I've been there, I felt that, and someone else has. And that is such a transformative and cathartic experience when you get to see something that you recognize on the screen. And then, you know, we get the joy of talking about it, but I think it's that collective experience. And I find myself so grateful, you know, we're sitting in Wakanda forever and I won't spoil anything about the film, but there was definitely a moment where the theater went silent and you could just hear sniffles around the Mm -hmm. auditorium. And I thought, what an incredible thing, just this disparate group of strangers to come together and say, we all love this thing and we all feel moved by it. And I think that, beautiful connection is what makes the theater experience so powerful and why I'm so thankful. You know, you storytellers out there, you dreamers, you ones who are risking so much to be able to put your stories out there. Like, thank you for doing that because, you know, some 83 years later, there might be three big movie geeks who get to talk about it for two hours and we are immensely thankful for that. Um, if you're not currently following us on social media, please follow us at how could you podcast on Instagram at how could you pod on Twitter, I guess. Um, (laughs) How could you uh, podcast on Facebook? We post a lot of things there. You can always email us thoughts and suggestions at how could you podcast at gmail.com. We have a YouTube page, which is youtube.com backslash how could you podcast, where you can actually uh, listen to these episodes on YouTube if that's your preferred format. Um, upcoming um, at Frank Banco Alehouse Cinemas, our, uh, <laughs> our December screening for the first Saturday Horror Series is a film called Seeds. Um, in many ways, the antithesis to something like Wizard of Oz, but going to be a lot of fun um, at Nostalgia Cinema the Saturday after Thanksgiving at Civic Theater. We're going to mean to be showing uh, 1951 Scrooge, which is a Christmas Carol starring Alistair Sim. Please come out and check that. Anthony, anything you want to promote coming up at the cinema? I've never seen that film. 
Oh, oh, Liam and David. Yes, I got that. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, I don't think I'd ever think I could give you a how could you, so that's quite remarkable. Um, I'm thankful for yeah, that yeah. moment. <laughs> I, I would love to come, but I'm in Florida for Thanksgiving. That's fair. All right. so. <laughs> Anything coming up at Frank Banco Ale House Cinemas you'd like to promote? Uh, so I will say that on Friday, we are opening Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Yes. Uh, it is, it is going to be a Netflix one, but we're going to have it for two weeks before it drops on Netflix, and I'm pretty pumped about it, because you know you got to see Del Toro on the big screen. 100%. And I've heard people say that this, I've heard a lot of reviews say this is his best film since Pan's Labyrinth. And five years ago, he directed a movie that won Best Picture. <laughs> so, yeah. I see Lauren's face like, all right, convince me. Oh, yeah. let's do this. <laughs> I'm just going to text you be like, no, it doesn't. Or be like, yes, it does. Oh, my yeah. God. Um, <laughs> excellent. So check out steelstacks.org backslash film. You can see all the amazing things that Anthony has been programming and bringing to the Lehigh Valley. Um, Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. And to all of our fans, we are so thankful for you guys to come in and listen to us each time we, we put out an episode. So thank you for that. Enjoy your dinners. Hope they're all delicious. And have a wonderful time with whoever you call family. And until next time, enjoy the Odyssey. Oh, 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 o